so thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, for, for those of you who are not um, presenters or, or panelists, if you could turn your video off, um, that way um, the, all the attendees will see just the videos of the, um, of the speakers today. Um, and for everyone on the call, if you hover over one of the um, videos on the right, you can, there's, a, there's three dots and a, and a drop down menu. And the bottom option on that is to hide non video participants. And so then you'll just see those of us who are um, speaking um, rather than seeing a bunch of black boxes with people's names on them. Um, so, um, yeah, thank you for everyone who's here today for, for attending this. Um, and, and a particular thanks to all of the organizers who have helped put this together. Um, we've we've uh, spent the last two months organizing this and, and lining up the, the speakers and presenters today. And um, we have just some incredible presentations that, that I'm really excited for. And uh, I'm sure that you'll all be able to enjoy those. Um, so this is an interesting time for all of us. Um, with the pandemic, we've all been social isolating. And so now we're doing this over Zoom rather than having an in-person uh, rather than having an, an in-person summit. Um, so it's kind of a unique time. And uh, at the same time, our, uh, we have thousands of people marching in the streets demanding racial justice. Um, we're all very well aware of climate change and the actions that are being taken in Maine and elsewhere to help address the climate crisis. And the, the pandemic is, is creating um, the, the biggest recession that we've seen in at least 80 years. So um, we're at kind of a nexus of environmental and social and financial problems in the world. And um, the Green Bank is a solution that can help to move us towards um, better, a better world in, in all those different realms, um, socially, financially, and uh, environmentally. It's clearly not going to solve everything uh, but it is a critical first step and um, I'm excited to have you all here today and be able to share with you a whole bunch of information about what green banks are and how they work. Um, and while most of the protests are around racial justice and police brutality, it is important for us to keep in mind the, the systemic injustices in the fossil fuel system uh, today. Uh, most refineries and um, fossil fuel power plants, um, the, the majority of them, more than half, are in low-income communities of color. And so those communities are um, disadvantaged and, and, are, and are, have very negative health outcomes from that with uh, high rates of asthma and cancer and, and other things um, because of that. Um, and so as we transition to clean energy, in Maine, we can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and help to reduce those, those disparities and injustices elsewhere around the country. And at the same time, we can retain billions of dollars in our local economy, creating thousands of, upon thousands of jobs, um, putting people back to work to, to uh, build ourselves out of the recession. And so, um, Hopefully this summit today will give you all a good overview of what a green bank is and how they work and some of the next steps that we can take here in Maine. Um, up first, um, we have Abe Wapner from the Coalition for Green Capital. And I've worked with the Co Coalition for Green Capital over the last six years. I, I was working for the Nevada Governor's Office of Energy um, and helped to pass a law creating a, a green bank um, the Nevada Clean Energy Fund out there, and the Coalition for Green Capital was instrumental in leading um, the, the Green Bank study that we conducted and has just been tremendously helpful and, is a, and they're a wealth of knowledge. Um, and so I'll turn it over to Abe and um, let you take it from there. And thank you very much for joining us. Great, thanks so much, David. Uh, let me share my screen with you all so that you can and uh, just real quick reminder for, for those of you who have joined more recently, um, if you can turn your videos off, um, so just the people who are speaking today um, will have their video showing. 
and you can hide all of the non-video participants if you hover over a video there's three dots that appear and and that brings up a drop down menu and the bottom option is to hide non-video participants and that way you'll be able to see the the, the video screens of of the speakers today um thank you and go ahead abe great thanks david um so i work for the Coalition for Green Capital. And I'm hoping I can talk to you all a little bit today about what is a green bank um, and then how that might be uh, relevant to what's been going on in Maine today. Uh, I think given, as, as David said, the kind of current state of affairs that we find ourselves in, um, I think this is pretty crazy that we're all getting together for a summit on Zoom. Um, I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about uh, green banks as a tool for economic recovery. Um, as kind of we've been thinking about the impacts of COVID and next steps moving forward towards redevelopment, um, we at CGC see, see a green bank as a, a powerful tool that, that can be used um, to help put us on the right track uh, towards recovery. So just to kind of couch that in some facts, uh, about 10% of, of Maine's workers are, are out of work right now. Um, looking at the data earlier in the week, there's about 175 uh, residents that have, that have filed for um, unemployment, um, about 70,000 continuing unemployment claims. And on top of that, you know, 25,000 people have just dropped out of the labor force entirely. So there's a significant portion of people that are out of work and need to find a way to get back to work. And currently at the federal level, um, we're seeing that spending is going towards kind of direct stimulus, it's not going to, to job creation currently. So things like the PPP, but we need some tools that are going to address the amount of unemployment that we're seeing right now and, and get people back to work. Um, CGC has done a number of, of uh, polls nationally to try and understand um, what kind of tactics uh, clean energy voters support. And we're seeing that about seven in 10 uh, people um, support this idea that you know, the government should be investing money in building clean energy infrastructure. Um, they see it as a you know, smart way to, to spend dollars to put people back to work and, and um, repair the economy. And so the way that we think that that can happen is through uh, a federal green bank. And CGC is pushing really hard um, to create a, a national green bank that would put $35 billion into a, a clean energy jobs fund. Um, that would kind of channel money through state and local green banks that exist across the country, including one that you know, may or may not um, happen in Maine to, to put Americans back to work. Uh, we recently commissioned a, a study with Vivid Economics to try and understand the, the job impacts of this kind of a fund at the national level. Um, and we're seeing that it could create about five and a half uh, million jobs over five years. So given that there's about 21 and a half million um, continuing unemployment claims in the U.S. right now, uh, a, a green bank at the U.S. level could uh, put about one in four folks back to work. These, these jobs could be um, spread out across the economy, so they're not just in clean energy generation. We're also talking about building efficiency, agriculture, clean transportation, and they're not just um, kind of skilled, uh, skilled jobs. They also um, have a fair amount of kind of administration sales, um, they're spread out across the economy to accommodate the kind of breadth of the types of people that um, need to be to put back to work. Um, and I think like David mentioned earlier, it's also really critical that, that these funds target those uh, frontline communities that have been most impacted by climate change um, and have been historically left behind. So uh, part of the bill includes um, a 20% carve out for, for dollars to flow towards um, low to moderate income communities and those that have been impacted by climate change. So we see a green bank as a, as a really powerful tool to uh, help create jobs um, in the clean energy sector and, and drive those dollars into the parts of the economy um, that need them most. So I realize I haven't really told you what a green bank is yet. So I'd love to, to dive into um, talking a little bit more about that. Um, so I'll start off by introducing myself and my organization. Um, I'm a program director at CGC where we work to uh, 
advocate for and, and set up green banks across the country. Um, we were created about 10 years ago to advocate for a federal green bank as part of the Waxman-Markey bill. Um, it had bipartisan support, but since the bill didn't pass, uh, the green bank never got created. Um, we took that idea to Connecticut um, and made the nation's first green bank, the Connecticut Green Bank. And I think um, we're all very lucky to get to hear from Brian Garcia later today, who will talk a little bit more about that organization and the, the great impacts that they've had. But given the success in Connecticut, um, we have taken that model and gone kind of Johnny Appleseed across the country, um, everywhere from Rhode Island to Hawaii, uh, creating green banks that have been able to uh, drive dollars into clean energy development. Um, we're a nonprofit supported by, by um, some major global foundations uh, to do this work. So what exactly is a green bank? Um, this is a definition we like to use at CGC, and I will just read it out loud for you all before we kind of dive into the specifics of what everything means. Green banks are mission-driven institutions that use innovative financing to accelerate the transition to clean energy and fight climate change. So what exactly do I mean by that? Um, there's a couple different words in there that I'd love to kind of unpack for you all. So first, green banks are, are mission-driven. And what this means is, is green banks attempt to be additive in the markets where they work. So a green bank really strives to identify the local market gaps that exist and then raise and deploy capital to fill those gaps. And I'll get into what those gaps are a little bit later. Um, but the other important thing to note about green banks is that they aren't traditional banks. They don't take deposits. Um, and a lot of them have actually um, kind of taken on the nomenclature uh, of clean energy funds to more accurately kind of represent that they are specialized investment vehicles. Green banks are institutions. So as an institution, a green bank um, is kind of market facing and attempts to be durable. Um, something that's going to, to stick around in the market and be an ongoing resource for developers and other actors. Given that they're market facing, they are flexible and responsive as things change in the real world. Um, and they use a variety of different tools to do that, that can change over time depending on, on how the markets evolve. Um, financing. So green banks use financing, not grants. And what I mean by that is that green banks invest in projects um, that pay back so that they can recycle that capital over time, bringing it back into the market. Um, they work in tandem with other market development activities, sometimes administering those, sometimes working alongside them, such as you know, rebates from utilities that exist um, and uh, other kind of market development uh, activities that go on in the state. So, like I said, green banks have been uh, established uh, coast to coast um, across the US. Um, and they form a, a national network of, of uh, mission-driven actors that can really deploy capital at scale. Um, we see this as a really powerful opportunity uh, for if there's a national, a pool of capital at the national level, um, that capital would be deployed through this network of green banks to um, most effectively target the local needs of uh, markets where green banks exist. Um, Currently, CGC runs something called the American Green Bank Consortium, um, which is a trade group to pull together all of these green banks that, that do exist to discuss best practices, um, joint fundraising, and kind of uh, advocacy opportunities, et cetera. Um, the green bank model has been successful to date. Um, green banks across the US have driven about $5 billion in cumulative investment, um, which uh, is actually a small portion of the amount that's been done globally. Uh, if you look at some of the countries like the United Kingdom or Australia that have created uh, national green banks, um, they've done the lion's share of, of the clean energy investment across the globe. And so we actually see that as uh, telltale that there is really strong opportunity um, to do this um, in kind of a national coordinated way across the U.S. But to date in the U.S., it's been state and local green banks that have been driving this change, and they've been doing so effectively. Um, one part of the green bank model that is particularly uh, attractive is that green banks have been able to leverage in private capital through the, the mechanisms that they use. Um, and on average, every dollar that a green bank in the US has spent has pulled in about $3 of private capital. Um, this investment has, has led to a lot of development and has you know, enabled places where green banks exist to um, get closer towards their climate goals. So green banks can, can be you know, powerful tools to help a state uh, reach 
the, the goals that they set for themselves. How do green banks do this? Um, so something that we've learned is that green banks can and should do a lot of different things depending on the needs in the market. Um, one thing a green bank shouldn't do is kind of come into a market and replace something that's already existing. So green banks don't come in and take projects away from private investors. They try to work in partnership with them. Similarly, they don't kind of come in and try to replace existing grant programs or, or market development activities that exist. They're looking for those gaps that are currently there, and then they're trying to develop tailored solutions to fill those gaps. So I've listed here a couple of the common barriers to investment that green banks have seen in different markets. Um, the first one is kind of this perceived project risk. And one thing we'll see when we're talking to, to private lenders is that they often don't really know how to uh, invest in um, clean energy projects or, or, or uh, evaluate them appropriately for risk. And so one thing that green banks have done effectively is come in with credit enhancements to make those lenders more comfortable um, loaning into clean energy projects. Um, and I think Brian made touch on this later in the day when he talks about Connecticut, that they've been largely successful working with a network of local banks in the state to encourage them to make loans directly to projects. Another barrier that uh, we often see green banks able to overcome is kind of the inefficiencies of scale. Uh, for a private investor, it makes, it, it costs about as much for them to invest in, you know, a five, $500 million project as it does for them to invest in a $500,000 project just due to the um, transaction costs that are associated with the project. So a lot of the times they won't really focus on those smaller projects. And what a green bank can do is um, kind of take the burden of, of, of doing this uh, transaction costs. And um, once they've gotten a sufficient number of those smaller projects together, they can aggregate and resell those up into broader capital markets. So basically they can connect uh, private capital with those smaller projects that the um, private investors might not touch on. Uh, another, another barrier that we often see is kind of marginal economics or just difficulty making projects pencil. Um, and given the kind of flexible nature of Green Bank's capital, they can come in and help kind of reduce costs from financing to uh, make those projects pencil just by flat out reducing costs. And they can do that either through providing more flexible debt or by coming in uh, to de-risk a transaction and, and get private actors more comfortable offering better terms. Lastly, um, I'll just mention briefly kind of first and kite transactions, which I think are fairly self-explanatory, but a green bank can um, kind of do the brain damage for a new technology or a new sector of the market uh, where they can help prove out an investment strategy um, make that publicly available, show that it does work and that you can invest and make money in these projects and then um, kind of hand the reins over to the private sector so that they can start investing in those technologies. And, um, I think a great example of this is in the UK where they basically kicks the green bank there, kickstarted the offshore wind, um, an investment in offshore wind industry and then turned it over to large scale pension funds that were able to, to fund further development. Um, so, the one kind of key component of a green bank that allows them to do all of these activities is that green banks rely on having mission-driven capital for their investment in startup. Um, historically, this has come from state or federal governments. Um, and so almost all green banks have been created using seed capital from those sources. Uh, states have found, and, and the federal government have found a variety of ways to, to support this development, including um, grants from ARA dollars that were available, um, Greenhouse, regional greenhouse gas initiative uh, dollars, which I think are being used in New Jersey right now. Um, and then uh, also utility surcharges um, or kind of utility uh, settlement mergers that have also been used to capitalize green banks. Foundations have played a key role in, in helping uh, add to that capital stack as well. Um, and we've seen them layer in kind of program related investments um, to supplement the balance sheets of green banks across the country. Um, also, foundations have been critical providing grants for kind of the startup phase, um, as well as uh, pre-development work to understand the opportunity for green banks. Um, I'll just point out here that, you know, obviously the sources of capital for a main green bank remain to be determined. So really excited to, to hear how the conversation goes today um, around um, what might be, you know, a, a best place to, to start thinking about. Um, how a green, main green bank could get that kind of mission-driven capital for investment. Um, 
And then I'll end on this point here, which is I think that um, we're really excited about this opportunity at the federal level. Um, and that would, if it, if, you know, if it comes to pass in, in 2020 or 2021, it would create um, real potential to scale up the operations of existing state green banks, especially if, if one were to be created here in Maine. Um, so you know, if a, a Maine green bank were created with a small amount of investment capital, uh, $35 billion coming in from Congress would then be distributed um, across the country and the Maine Green Bank would be in a pretty great position to um, get some of those dollars and, and scale up its operations in a major way to help kind of create some of the impacts I was talking about earlier um, with jobs and, and development uh, across the clean energy uh, markets. So I will stop there. Uh, here's my contact information in case any of you guys want to follow up individually. But uh, I think, David, we can leave some time for questions too, uh, if anybody has anything burning that um, I can answer today. I think you're on mute, David. Dave, I'm gonna unmute you. There you go. Uh, thank you. Um, Matt, do you have some questions that have come in from, uh, from the audience at all? Yeah, there were a couple. Um, one quick one, Abe, is are these slides available on your website? Uh, they're not on our website, but happy to make them available after this presentation if that is useful. Okay, we can follow up with everyone and share. Um, and then, yeah, a couple questions. One was um, about how, how do Green Bates vet, screen, and select um, what they invest in? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so like I said, green banks are really focused on identifying the market gaps that exist in the specific area that they're trying to invest in. Um, energy is a very local issue, just given local policies, utilities, uh, and um, just the nature of the, the projects themselves. And so um, what a green bank will do is kind of analyze the opportunity in each market, try and figure out where those gaps are, and then develop tailored solutions that focus on them. And, Kind of like I, I talked about above, those can be either, you know, we're not seeing a lot of development in this particular technology, like say a green, like the New York Green Bank is really focused on trying to figure out how they can, you know, crack the nut of storage and offshore wind to get the state moving into to that sector of the economy. Or the idea could be, um, we're really not seeing a lot of development in the kind of LMI space. So in Baltimore, um, there's a carve out for uh, LMI, uh, off takers for community solar that hasn't really been used yet. And so the Green Bank there is trying to tackle the issue, of, you know, how can we make sure that community solar is providing energy um, to all members of the population there. And so Green Banks are really driven by the needs of the kind of local geography in which they find themselves um, and the process for which by which they determine that um, is, is kind of a needs analysis of that market. Thanks, Abe. Um, just following up on that, and then there are a few more questions. Can you define LMI? Uh, yeah, low to moderate income. I think it's a, a HUD um, term, uh, but it, 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 it is it's the sector of the population below uh, the median income. Okay. Great. Uh, th thank you, Abe. And um, Matt, I think we'll pause the questions there uh, to keep on schedule. And so if you can uh, save all the questions that come in that, that haven't been answered yet, and there may be an opportunity for uh, Brian Garcia or a panelist to answer some of those, um, but otherwise we'll try to follow up with um, all the audience or anyone who uh, has additional questions and we can follow up with them individually. Um, so up next, we have Steve Klemmer. And Steve is the Director of Energy Research and Analysis at the Union of Concerned Scientists. And um, he recently did a study looking at uh, clean energy financing in Maine. And so he's gonna talk more specifically about, about right here in Maine and what we can do. Um, so thanks, Steve. Thanks, David. Uh, let me know if you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. And I, I really want to thank David for inviting me to this uh, summit, as well as for all the work he and others did on, on organizing this. It's really a 
timely and, and great event. As David said, um, my presentation is going to focus on uh, the, a paper that we wrote in 2016 that highlights the benefits of creating and implementing a green bank in Maine. I also used this information more recently in a recommendation that I made uh, to the Maine Climate Council as part of the Energy Working Group. And uh, Hannah Pingree, I think, will be talking more about the council later, but I just wanted to highlight that as well, that this is something that's being actively considered in the Climate Council process. So let me start by highlighting um, four key numbers that I think will help everyone understand the enormous challenge and magnitude of the investment that's going to be needed to achieve Maine's climate and energy goals. The first number, 80%. So Maine has a, a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050 with an interim target of 45% by 2030. 80% um, is also the target Maine has for renewable electricity with its renewable portfolio standard that increases to 100% by 2050. Maine also has offshore wind and distributed solar goals that will contribute to those renewable targets. Second number is 30%, which is um, the efficiency goals for Maine requiring a reduction in electricity and natural gas use by 2020 and a 30% reduction in heating oil use by 2030. As part of that goal, Maine also has um, targets to install 100,000 heat pumps by 2025 weatherize 100% of homes and 50% of businesses by 2030. So Maine ha really has a lot of some of the key policies that are in place that are going to be needed to uh, achieve the climate and clean energy goals. But the amount of investment, um, which is the next number, 40 to 50 billion is a rough estimate from a couple of recent studies of how much might be needed over the next 30 years to achieve these targets. And while that number seems uh, pretty daunting, um, the good news is that Maine currently spends about $4.4 billion on imported fossil fuels as part of a total energy bill of $6.2 billion. So redirecting um, that $4.4 billion or some portion of that to invest in clean energy can be done without having uh, while creating jobs, as Abe was saying, reducing emissions and also keeping energy affordable in Maine. Uh, the investment that I mentioned before that would be needed to get to 2050 is roughly on the order of one and a half billion dollars per year on average. So we clearly ha are spending enough money already on energy that could be redirected into clean energy technologies. So um, not all of this investment actually needs to be covered by a green bank. Um, I think, as Abe was saying, most green bank pr programs are targeted at populations and sectors that have limited access to capital, such as homeowners and renters, small businesses, industrial facilities, uh, farms, nonprofits, institutions, local governments. Um, it's also important to address equity issues, as Abe and others were saying, to, by providing grants and low interest loans to low and moderate income households. Um, in my view, a green bank doesn't really need to cover utility scale investments in things like wind and solar and, and electricity grid infrastructure. Most of the entities that will be doing that have um, much greater access to capital. And you know, that said, there's, there are ways to lower the cost of capital for those larger scale projects as well. Um, a green bank um, uh, would fund you know, some of the typical types of investments that we've already been talking about, of course, energy efficiency and renewable energy, a couple of key ones that are really going to be needed to address uh, Maine's climate goals. We'll be deploying heat pumps in buildings, um, electric vehicles and charging infrastructure is also going to be really important to reduce emissions in the transportation sector. Energy storage is also going to be needed over time to help integrate high levels of renewables. And things like combined heat and power uh, and other strategies in the industrial sector are also done through a green bank that could um, really help Maine achieve, achieve its uh, emission reduction targets. Another um, potential area that a green bank could focus on is climate resilient infrastructure. And Abe touched on this a little bit too, but some other states are putting significant resources into infrastructure, especially things that will help um, 
states and communities adapt to climate change. Um, in particular, there's a couple of really good win-win solutions like solar plus storage or clean energy microgrids that could be deployed for critical infrastructure. And those are win-wins because they can, in addition to providing power during outages um, from extreme weather, they could also reduce reliance on diesel generators and reduce emissions. So really a win-win from both an adaptation and a, a mitigation standpoint. And these solutions are already being implemented and demonstrated on several island communities in Maine. Uh, several financial products and services, um, David, um, I'm sorry, uh, Abe touched on a few of these already, so I'm not gonna repeat those, but a couple others that he didn't talk about. So direct lending is another um, strategy that's obviously familiar to, to many people, uh, direct types of lending to consumers and businesses. And Efficiency Maine is currently doing this uh, for residential energy efficiency. I think they're spending, in 2019, spent about $5.5 million on something like 760 projects. Um, that's about 10% of the, um, their budget in 2019. So clearly, um, those types of loans and revolving loans could be expanded to other households and businesses uh, and other technologies as well, as I discussed before. Uh, the other thing um, I'm not sure if Abe touched on was some of the sort of structured products and financing tools. So that would include things like property assessed clean energy financing, state-backed leasing programs for renewables, performance-based incentives, and those types of things, which are additional products that can be provided. As others have said, um, it's really important bank that's implemented in Maine is equitable and benefits all residents, including low and moderate income households and disadvantaged communities. And Efficiency Maine and Coastal Enterprise is already offering some programs like this that could be built upon. There's, of course, the, the state weatherization uh, program as well that uses federal funds. Um, but there's also some really good models out there. Um, I'm not going to get into the, the three that I have listed here. Um, I'm not going to get into all of them. I think um, Brian might talk about the Connecticut program during his presentation, but um, the one I wanted to just give a quick example about was the one Gabe was talking about, um, the Baltimore Climate Access Fund, which I do think has some relevance to Maine. Um, as he was saying that um, in, in Maryland, they require that 30% of the community solar serves low income and moderate income households. Um, but developers were really hesitant um, to participate in that because of the perceived high credit risk. Lenders and institutions, I'm, I'm sorry, lenders and investors were also reluctant to finance um, those things because of low return expectations. So I think as Abe was alluding to, they adopted some credit enhancements like a loan loss reserve program um, in case of loan defaults. Um, they also have are making available low cost debt uh, with below market interest rates and, and lower transaction fees and flexible terms like that. And one of the reasons why I said this is relevant to Maine is because the, the legislation that was passed that created the distributed solar um, targets um, includes a carve out for 10% of, um, of, of that energy to go towards low and moderate income households. So this is a type of program that um, could be considered by uh, adopting in Maine to help achieve the goals of that program. So uh, Abe also mentioned us some potential funding sources. So this is something we also explored both in the paper as well as in um, actually in the energy working group. So a lot of the existing sources that are being used by Efficiency Maine and others, um, CO2 allowance revenues from the Regional Greenhouse Gas in Initiative, and system benefits charges are big sources of funding. Some federal funds from ARA and uh, some, some DOE grant programs. Some of the settlements like um, the Volkswagen settlement that's being used for uh, EV, EV rebates and charging infrastructure, um, RPS compliance payments, as well as um, money that comes from the ISO New England Ford capacity market. But really to amplify the impact of a Green Bank in Maine, we, there needs to be new sources of funding. And there's several different places this could potentially come from. One is uh, revenue bonding. 
Uh, another is federal, a federal green bank, as Abe was mentioning, as well as some of the stimulus and infrastructure proposals that are under consideration right now in Congress to help the economy recover from COVID. Um, other things like on-bill financing, and as I mentioned before, property assessed clean energy financing, which I think Michael Stoddard will be talking about more later. Um, those have been pretty successful mechanisms in other states. Another very large source of potential capital is institutional investors. And this could come from things like insurance companies, endowment funds, pension funds, hedge funds, those types of things. And there's really literally trillions of dollars available from those sources of funding. They also have very low cost capital and a very low risk tolerance. Um, the, you know, Maine's own public uh, employee pension system is another possibility there that would kind of fit into that category. Um, and another um, very large source of potential money would also be a fee on CO2 emissions from oil and gas. This was definitely talked about in the um, Climate Council discussions and is included in the recommendations. And of course, um, this you know, would probably require some kind of implementation either on a regional or national level, um, but that's another um, source of potential funding. Some of the potential hosts and partners that um, we explored and identified for um, hosting a Green Bank, um, I think the most obvious candidate from our perspective is Efficiency Maine because they're already doing programs like this. They have a lot of experience. Um, they do have loan programs like this, as I mentioned earlier. They've recently expanded some of their programs into uh, heat pumps and EVs. But there's also some other entities that do similar types of things. There's the Finance Authority of Maine, and they provide an array of loans and other financing programs to support startup and growth of Maine businesses. There's a Maine Technology Initiative um, that works with entrepreneurs and businesses to develop and commercialize new technologies. Coastal Enterprises, um, they provide some financing to, to renewable energy and energy efficiency projects, especially ones in rural parts of the state, as well as um, small gateway cities that are going, undergoing economic transitions. They also recently launched uh, a new subsidiary that's focused on investing in solar projects in communities with low incomes. And of course, the other partners, the, the, the state energy office and other state agencies that are involved in implementing related energy programs, as well as um, the Coalition for Green Capital and other states that are oh, I'm sorry, that are um, implementing um, green bank programs to, to amplify Maine's impact. So as part of our 2016 paper, UCS developed a spreadsheet tool to analyze the impacts of developing a green bank in Maine and other states. As an illustrative example um, of using this tool, I looked at uh, what could happen from uh, roughly a $50 million initial capitalization of the bank uh, which is, is about equal to what um, Efficiency Maine is currently spending on all of its programs. So this is roughly double uh, what's, what was spent in 2019. And I assume that about half of the money would go to energy efficiency and the other half to solar and every dollar of public money would leverage about $5 in private investment based on experience from the New York and Connecticut Green Banks. Based on these assumptions, Maine could leverage uh, this initial capitalization into a billion dollars of cumulative investment over the next 15 years in renewables and efficiency. And this investment could deploy about 400 megawatts of solar. It could save homes and businesses about $118 million per year on their electricity bills. And it could also reduce CO2 emissions by more than 740,000 tons. And obviously, as, as stated earlier, these investments would create jobs in Maine, they would also provide tax revenues for local communities, and they would also provide um, important public health benefits as well for local communities. Sorry, I didn't click on the other bullets there. So I'm gonna conclude with that, um, and I'd be happy to take uh, any questions. Time to do so, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, Dave, do we have a, a couple minutes? Yeah, we, we have about five minutes. So if there are some questions, we can uh, ask okay. Steve those. Um, yeah, Steve, one of the questions um, is about 
other green banks seeming to focus on public infrastructure. Um, some of your slides mention green banks could be used for heat pumps and weatherization. Is this a different model? And are there other states doing these small projects with private end users? Well, um, I no, I don't think it's a different model. I think other state green bank programs are um, implementing programs like that with uh, revolving loan type funds um, that cover heat pumps, that cover uh, low and moderate income households um, and disadvantaged communities, as, as I was mentioning. Um, Abe can maybe speak a little bit more to that. So I think um, that's that those programs exist in many places. Um, as far as infrastructure goes, um, I think, you know, I, Rhode Island is, is a really good example of a state that's really put <laughs> a, a particular emphasis on infrastructure. And as I mentioned, um, the, some of that is going to climate resilience infrastructure, helping local communities um, adapt to climate change and, and invest in projects that would help them to do so. Um, in addition to that, uh, there's, they, they have a bunch of programs oriented around investing in sort of environmental issues related to like replacing septic systems, brownfields, uh, building roads and bridges, and, and other kinds of more uh, traditional infrastructure maybe, uh, as well as things oriented around drinking water and so forth. So there, there's definitely examples like that out there. Um, I think New York is also investing some of their money in, in, in ways like that as well. Great, thanks. And um, this is a, just a specific question about ARRA. Could you just explain what, what that is? That was the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act from 2009 that followed the, the last recession that we had, um, where a bunch of money was um, put together by Congress and made available to, for a variety of purposes, but that included money for, for energy projects, especially um, clean energy, renewable energy projects. And so my understanding, and, and maybe Michael Stoddard or somebody can talk to this more later, but um, I think Maine got a significant um, chunk of money from that that they used to help fund some of their programs, including their loan program. And some of that money is still being used today. So I think that's a really good example of what could happen from the current crisis that we're in um, and potentially other stimulus packages that, that are coming down the pike. I know from work that we're doing at the federal level, there's very active <laughs> uh, efforts uh, to include these things. And I, and I believe um, at least some of the proposals from the House um, include several provisions that are um, either funding for energy, um, at the Green Bank, is, as Abe was talking about, um, infrastructure related things, uh, as well as tax credit extensions. So, all of those things could be very beneficial to, to achieving uh, a green bank and, and achieving Maine's um, climate and clean energy goals. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Matt, were there any other questions for Steve or should we uh, move into the panel discussion? Yeah, I think for the panel there, were, um, yeah, we have some other ones I think I'll follow up with Avon, but I think that's it for Steve. Okay, great. Um, are all of the panelists able to unmute yourselves? Um, give a little wave if you need me to unmute you. I'm not sure exactly how the settings are. All right, looks like you're all unmuted now. Um, Great, thank you very much, Steve. Um, that was fantastic. Um, so um, for the panel discussion, um, I'll introduce all the panelists briefly and then let them uh, introduce themselves and, and speak about their, their backgrounds and experience a little bit. And then I have a handful of questions that I'll ask and then we'll turn it over um, to any questions that come in over the chat. So, um, Today on our residential panel discussion, we have Catherine Cully, who is co-owner of Redfern Properties. We have Monty Haynes, who is a senior account and loan program manager with Efficiency Maine. 
Uh, we have Leanne Nichols, who is the president of the Greater Portland Board of Realtors. Brian Robinson is vice president of Evergreen Home Performance. And Anya Wright uh, just recently graduated from College of the Atlantic and is, a, is the youth rep on the Climate Council. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Um, and Catherine, I'll let you introduce yourself first and we'll just uh, go in that order. Awesome. Thanks, David. I'm so happy to be here. And I've been reading up a lot on the Green Bank, so it's a very exciting concept. Um, I am a principal and co-founder of Redfern Properties with my husband, Jonathan. Uh, we developed the first uh, LEED certified platinum single family home in Portland, Maine in 2008. And since then have continued to use the principles that we learned on that project to develop more and more sustainable infill projects in the Portland area, including Joe's Smoke Shop on Hiawatha um, or at Longfellow Square on Congress Street. And our current project is redeveloping the Mercy Hospital uh, site on State Street. So that's my background in energy development for residential. Thank you. Um, Lee, uh, Monty, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Hello. Um, my name is Monty Haynes. I am the senior accountant and loan program manager at Efficiency Maine. Um, I've worked in accounting for over the past 15 years and it's been a great experience. Great. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, Leanne? Or Monty, everybody. did you have more? Oh, no, I didn't. No. Okay, thanks. Go ahead, Leanne. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me here today. I um, have been a realtor for almost 30 years in our Cumberland County area, largely. I live in Freeport in a home that has geothermal heating and cooling, as well as a lot of solar panels, and really enjoy that tremendously and the, the lifestyle that that provides for my family. Have also noticed over the years a tremendous shift amongst the consumer population, really becoming very sensitive to their energy costs in their homes when I've been helping them in the, in the purchase process. So that's really kind of fueled my fascination in this developing sector. Um, my husband is currently working on a subdivision in Freeport where um, he's going to be building three sustainable homes as well, which we will then rent out. Um, as president of the Greater Portland Board of Realtors, I am one of the founding members of the Sustainability Advisory Group, which is following the direction of National Association of Realtors. And we're doing a lot of work on this sort of stuff and very excited to bring this information to our consumer population as well as our, our realtor population. Great, thanks. Uh, Brian, you're up next. Well, thanks for having me, David, and thanks for organizing all of this. This is uh, yeoman work that you're doing, I think, for everybody and, and honored to be a part of it. Um, I'm a, a partner and building analyst uh, with Evergreen Home Performance, uh, founded in 2006. We're a uh, residential uh, vendor with Efficiency Maine, uh, providing uh, efficiency services to about uh, 250 to 300 homeowners a year. Um, and we uh, also are sort of honored that we were the first to uh, help a Maine homeowner with the very first PACE loan in the, in the state back in 2011 using those a, a, ARRA funds on um, that revolving loan fund. Um, and uh, we're just thrilled to be working on the demand reduction side of, of things, uh, using less energy uh, so that uh, there can be some wonderful clean supply options to follow. Exactly. Great. Thank you. Um, Go ahead, Anya. Hi, everyone, and hi, all my fellow panelists. Um, my name is Anya Wright. I, like David said, just graduated from College of the Atlantic up in Bar Harbor. Um, and I'm also the youth representative on the Maine Climate Council and also the youth representative on the Buildings, Housing, and Infrastructure Working Group, um, which works with the Maine Climate Council. Um, and I'm especially interested in uh, climate justice. Uh, solutions for climate change um, and with David's NCR Club's help uh, brought this uh, Green Bank idea to 
the Buildings Working Group, and uh, I'm excited to see where it goes within the Climate Council. So thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, so, uh, Catherine, um, you've been doing sustainable construction and development for 15 years. What about the Green Bank really gets your attention? So one of the biggest stumbling blocks that I have with building efficiently and with solar alternative fuel sources is just straight up financing. And Abe touched on that quite a bit. He called it a gap in the system. But our financial structure, our banking structure, isn't set up for um, analyzing and incorporating green building practices into their appraisal process. Um, that was one of my biggest stumbling blocks very early. And it may be shifting in the residential arena, but it's definitely not that way in the commercial arena. It's a very set process of, of a return on investment and how your funds are working. So if I could separate out things like solar panels on my buildings into a different loan the way that the green Connecticut, the Connecticut Green Bank does, it makes it all of a sudden extremely possible. Um, because the construction loans that we get aren't exactly set up to, I'm already struggling with the construction costs. And so unfortunately, you know, a, a solar panel is the first thing to go on most of my projects. Um, so I think when I did my research on the Green Bank, the Connecticut Green Bank, I was super excited because all of their packages, they have about a dozen or so projects or products that are really geared towards homeowners, building owners, contractors to weatherize and uh, for, you know, changing over your gas, your oil furnace to a gas boiler putting solar panels on your roof or getting new windows, which all take a, a giant chunk of money. And then to have it separated out so it's not part of the appraisal process makes it very, it seems very easy to sustain or to do. So it actually eases the burden of weatherizing and upgrading your systems versus creating a burden for the homeowners or building owners, um, which is to me very exciting for especially Maine and the Connecticut bank is this also interesting because Connecticut has a similar issue where it's a it's a community that has a lot of old building stock. That is a huge user of fossil fuels in their economy. So they went directly very targeted at that arena of fossil fuel use. Um, yeah, fantastic. Uh, so, um, are there any other specific issues that you think that the Green Bank can address um, in your market segment or? Oh, definitely. I think, um, for example, we're putting, we're in the process of putting solar panels on, they can address back to, you know, to social equalization. Um, you know, no, there's no incentive for developers to put solar panels on uh, roofs of rental units because the owner of the building doesn't reap the reward. And I would argue that it's still not, a, it's back to the risk thing that Abe was also bringing up, that people aren't exactly sure if that's going to attract renters. It's, it, it may not. So there may not be a value add there, but if if the Green Bank can provide, I'm putting $100,000 worth of solar panels on a rental unit right now, um, but that requires $100,000 in cash. I have no way to finance that right now in Maine. There's no real way to do that. So if I can finance that at two to 3%, that becomes almost a no brainer in my opinion. And then I could do it on my larger projects that are that require a higher dollar amount to do. Yeah, um, and we can certainly look to see what other states are doing in that arena as well. Um, the the uh, rental situation is kind of the classic conundrum where um, the building owner 
uh, owns the building, but the renters are paying the utility bills. And so we end up with a situation where no one is incentivized to um, improve the efficiency of the building. Um, but I know that's one of the things that uh, Connecticut has done a good job of. And I, I can't say for certain whether Brian will speak more about that later, um, but hopefully he does. Um, well, thank you, Catherine. I'm gonna move on and, uh, and hopefully we can have time at the end for some additional questions. Um, so Monty, um, Efficiency Maine has some fantastic rebate programs. I've taken advantage of several of them in, in my house here. I've got a heat pump in the other room that thankfully it's cool enough today that it's not turned on. And I uh, worked with Evergreen on some great uh, insulation in my uh, crawl space in my house. Um, and, and so certainly appreciate the, um, the rebates. And uh, in, my, in my job with Revision Energy, I've referred a lot of heat pump customers to your residential loan program as well. Um, could you give us an overview of the loans that you currently have available through Efficiency Maine? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, as Steve alluded to um, in his presentation, we've, since 2011, um, that we've received ERA funds for our loan pro revolving loan program. And um, over that time, we've, fun we've given out around 4,300 loans, um, which equates to around 36 million in funding so far. So right now we actually have four loan products, which are unsecure, and then one loan product that's secured. And as for the unsecured products, and for, let me be clear, we, um, all the res these are tied to the residential rebates the loan program. So whatever residential rebate that we're offering is what um, a customer can receive a loan for. So let me go back to the four unsecured loan products. So there are four types and they're at like one type is loan one, which you can borrow between 1000 to 4,500 if you got a credit score of 580. Um, and that's at a 5.99% interest rate. Then we have a loan type two um, you have to have a credit score of 620 and you can borrow between $1,000 to $7,500 at a 5.99 interest rate. And then it goes on up to a loan type three and the interest rates drops down to 4.99 if you have a credit score of 640 and above. Um, and then you go to loan type four, which means credit score of 680. And that's also at a 4.99% interest rate and that's, you can borrow between $1,000 to $15,000. And as for our secured product, it's the PACE product, which Brian actually spoke about. Um, I think they did a project on when they first started. Um, and that one is, you don't need a credit score for that. However, we will, um, there will be a lien put on your home as a, and we'll be the junior lien holder on that loan for that project. So overall, like I said, we, our measures, you know, been great. And this, this loan program has been really taken off. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, and how would you envision or how would you see a green bank or other new financing programs helping to expand the reach and impact of your current residential programs? Well, I think, I think right now um, funding, if we had more funding, we could probably offer more products. Um, like right now, you know, we, the more fun, if, say for instance, if, you know, this COVID thing um, caused a lot of defaults, you know, that right now our revolving loan fund is pretty much self-funding and it's been going pretty good, you know, money in, money going out, kind of, you know, even out or, you know, increasing our pot of money that we have. But, you know, if something happens and we start having a lot of defaults, then either we might have to, you know, either slow down the loan program or, you know, stop it all together for a little while until we can kind of, recapitalize it. Um, so I think just more funding would, you know, would be a great thing and we could probably do way more stuff with it. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Monty. Thank you. Um, so uh, Leanne, um, how would a green bank and improved financing for efficiency and clean energy benefit the real estate industry in Maine? Well, uh, thank you for the question. Um, you know, it, I'm speaking on behalf of the real estate industry, but the real estate industry is really about the homeowners and the consumers. And in 2019 in Maine, the units sold increased here 
in our state 1.9 percent year over year to 18,424 transactions and our prices increased 3.7 percent to a statewide average median sales price of 275 527 dollars 275 thousand five hundred and twenty seven dollars that's a lot of money to pay for housing in a mostly rural state you know and now we're in the middle of a pandemic with the unemployment rate running at 9.3 percent which is so much higher than may of last year and uh, total units of single family uh, homes is down 5.6% for the year to date through June 23rd, uh, compared to the same date in 2019. Um, and in the face of that, our average sales price is actually up 4.1% so far year to date. So we're in the midst of a shortage of housing and really an affordability crisis that um, is very challenging for homeowners in our state. And I really believe that a green bank can um, allow more opportunities for consumers to take advantage of ways to create energy savings in their homes. And I think it's a much more stable thing. There was a study done in 2013 that said that uh, Energy Star homes actually are 32% less likely to default. So those are some pretty compelling reasons to expand upon, you know, the wonderful offerings of Efficiency Maine, because they do, do have some fabulous programs. But I think we need more, and our homeowners really want more. In 2012, NAR did a, a, a profile of home buyers and sellers, and nine out of 10 of those home buyers that were in the market at that time, and this is only expanded in my opinion, um, really said that costs for energy were very, very important, if not critical, to their decision in, in home purchase. So it's a, it's a pretty important thing. We are making gains. Um, even considering that our tax incentives are decreasing and with the limited programs that we do have. Um, in fact, last year, we had an increase of about 39% of homes that sold with so solar photovoltaics. We had a 33% increase in energy storage batteries in the home sales. We had a 22% increase in air exchangers for the tight air sealing that needs to happen. We had 41% increase in heat pump sales and a 47% increase in heat pump water heaters. So this is according to our multiple listing service data. Our data fields have expanded considerably to allow for homeowners to be able to market their homes appropriately that have these features. So we can kind of track that a little bit better too. But at the same time, you know, we do have about 68% of our homes were identified as burning oil. So we have a long way to go. We've got a lot of work to do. There are some great programs, but a green bank is only going to expand upon that. For example, on the Connecticut Green Bank um, website, there's some great homeowner testimonials. And a lot of those homeowners, even with the loan, are saving as much as $3,000 in their, their energy costs, in addition to still having to pay the loan amount on an annual basis. So that's pretty compelling. And I do believe homeowners really, really want better access to more funding for these, these opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. I've made a lot of improvements to both the homes that I've owned and that it's, it's a lot of work and a lot of hoops to jump through. Um, and we've had some conversations about FHA programs, that's federal housing authority programs, like their energy efficient mortgages and their solar loans that allow uh, home buyers to finance these types of improvements upfront. Uh, what, are, what is preventing existing programs like that from being used more broadly in Maine? That's a great question. I remember back in the early part of my career using the FHA 203k program uh, quite a bit to help friends of mine purchase uh, multifamilies on the Eastern Prom, for example, in Portland that needed some improvements. And it was really a tough program back then. And that's just for a standard 203k. Um, but when you add the energy efficiency component to it, it's a much more difficult process. We don't have the scale of appraisers in our state, nor loan officers that are really versed in this particular program. So it just, it just, it doesn't really work. Um, it, it gets a lot of bureaucratic hangups along the way. So from the research that I've done on um, the green banks and some of the other um, green financing opportunities that are coming available, specifically targeted in this direction, is it's, a, it's an easier process. And it's not necessarily tied to the title. It's not necessarily a home equity loan. It's, it's really tied to the amount of money that people would be spending on those energy costs. So that's really, it's just kind of a no brainer. Really excited about it. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so Brian, um, most efficiency upgrades will pay for themselves through energy savings over time. And I've seen projects with as low as a two year uh, payback and others can have you know, a considerably longer payback. Uh, but most of them will pay for themselves. 
but what barriers exist that prevent people from completing efficiency projects today? Well, great, great question. Thanks for asking, David. Um, I think if I can kind of embed the question in, in a slightly larger context, and that is that um, there's how quickly does it pay for itself, but it's also what value is embedded in the home. And I think this is a critical thing that perhaps the Green Bank stuff can help with, and I suspect the realtors would kind of miss uh, if they were not muted, <laughs> that when you make an efficiency investment in a home, whether uh, you know, it's in demand reduction um, or in supply, you embed a certain value in the home. It's more like a CD that you're purchasing. So you're taking money from somewhere and you're investing the principal in the house. So the home value tends to go up and the appraisal data nationwide, as well as in the Northeast for the last 20 years has shown this conclusively. And I see some positive nods, so I appreciate that Leanne and <laughs> others. Um, and then the interest on that is the savings that you will get. And the savings come in several forms, improved durability, comfort, with improved comfort, and decreased energy costs. So when you consider what you pay for your, your house uh, on a monthly basis, most people are paying the taxes and the insurance and the principal and the interest, and they're all also paying the energy. So if we include all of those things in as the carrying cost, then the efficiency improvements start to look a whole lot better when they're embedded in that monthly cost. So yes, the house costs more, but it's valued more, but you actually might pay the same as a lesser price house for that better performing house. Um, and it might even, you know, not that bigger is better, but it might be bigger. So I think that's kind of the context. In answer to your question more specifically, you know, what's, what is holding people back? I think there is certainly uh, in the last 10 years since, you know, the financial crisis of 2008 and all, um, some people are not really willing to take on more debt. They see debt as a problem. And so they're waiting to build up this nest egg. And I think if we can crack that nut for people, most people I believe aren't buying cars with cash nor should we be thinking of improvements with cash either. We need to break that um, cycle with people to understand that this is an investment like any other and we need to contextualize it in that way. And Efficiency Maine has been tremendously successful. I think um, Monty indicated, I think you said 4,000 loans over the, since 2009, that's phenomenal. But imagine what the state would look like with 8,000 or 12,000 or 40,000 loans. Um, uh, I think it's, I think that's a, you know, there's a, um, there's trouble with people getting over that hump of borrowing money. Um, but they think if they knew that the value is still there, that might help a bit. Kind of a long answer, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as I think Catherine and Leanne alluded to, it can be hard to demonstrate that value, unlike solar, where it's really obvious if you're driving up to a house that it has solar on it, um, the insulation is usually hidden behind the walls and, and hidden in the attic, and uh, it's much harder for people to recognize that it's there and, and the value that it's adding. Um, and uh, so how would you see increased access to financing um, and particularly if we, if we can create programs focused on the low income uh, segment, um, how would you see increased access to financing benefiting Evergreen's customers and Maine's efficiency industry? Great, another good question. Um, I think with increased you know, access to, to capital uh, for lower income uh, folks, you know, right now they're just absolutely struggling for the most part to keep paying the mortgage, or maybe it's a home that, that they already own, but they're, you know, the carrying costs and food on the table, gas in the lobster boat, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if they had access to capital, even with what might not be stellar um, credit ratings, uh, to do things beyond even that which Efficiency Maine helps to fund, uh, which might be important, um, you know, their greatest need might be safe windows so that they can open them because right now they're going to smash down on their child's fingers. Um, and uh, we can't finance those through PACE loans and things uh, of that nature. So 
yeah, I think it would broaden the scope of improvements that could be incorporated um, and uh, help them, you know, really start to transform some of these houses in the way they would love to do, but don't realize is, is possible and isn't really possible because no bank is going to loan them the money because they might look at the house and say, that's just not a great risk for us. It's worth $80,000 and, um, you know, they owe 60. We're not going to lend them the other 20 to, to make some improvements. And that's another point where Efficiency Maine has been phenomenal with that, not to get too technical, but that's 100% loan to value in some of their products where you can borrow money that nobody else would ever consider lending you from a commercial or a, a private bank. Yeah. Um, no, I've, I've run into issues around efficiency in solar for a long time and, and lining up financing. And uh, yeah, that, that's the nut to crack. So hopefully we can make this happen. Thank you, Brian. Um, Thank you. Anya, um, today's students and youth will be living and working through this clean energy transition that we're embarking on. Uh, what would you like to see happen as part of this process? Yeah, um, so very interesting time to be a young person right now. Um, between graduating into a pandemic, uh, economic collapse, climate change, and then um, large-scale protests against police brutality, definitely an interesting time. So, um, and I think what we're seeing with the, with all of these four major um, events and crises going on um, a big need to change systems um, and we need money to change those big systems a lot of the times um, upfront capital for long-term solutions so I think something that excites me about the green bank ideas um, answering some of those questions of there are so many great um, climate justice related solutions out there um, but a lot of the big questions are okay how do we make it happen um, and I really see this as an opportunity to make it happen. I was um, encouraged to by Abe's presentation, talking about um, those seven sectors of investment um, and certainly homes being one of them, but also there are so many sectors of our economy that can benefit from this. And as a young person going into the bizarre job market right now, that's definitely encouraging to me, um, yeah. Great. Um, thank you. And um, how can we ensure that everyone benefits, you know, as we're making this transition to clean energy and, and addressing climate change? Um, what are some ways that, that you can think of or how can we make sure that everyone benefits and there aren't people that continue to be left behind? Yeah, I think that's such an important question that I think all of us need to continue to ask ourselves as we go through this work and process. Um, I've been really encouraged by all the panelists today and all the presentations mentioning um, like uh, low income residents um, and emphasizing uh, care for, for those residents and making sure that opportunities are available. Um, yeah, and I think we need to ask ourselves questions. I'm, I'm not like super familiar with finance and banking. Um, I'm just proud of myself for doing my own taxes this year, but um, Obviously, the financial sector is not immune to um, systems of racism and oppression and sexism, and those are all systems that need to be addressed. Um, and so my hope would be that in creating this green bank that we can really start from um, grounds of making sure that we're uh, addressing those, those uh, inequities, including people at the table making um, decisions that represent communities that have been historically left behind. Um, and yeah, I was encouraged by the Connecticut Green Bank, um, Abe mentioning that 20% was allocated for low income residents. And I think when we do things in Maine, I would love to see that that number be larger. Um, I think that would be one really great concrete way of doing that. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's just a question that we can't ask once. It's something that we need to just keep coming back to um, because the systems that we're a part of are making us not want to ask those questions, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah, great. Um, thank you. Um, so Matt, if you want to um, come back on, um, have we received some questions over the chat? 
um, for everyone who's out there watching, uh, please feel free to chat a mess chat a question at Matt um, if you have something for the panel. Yeah, actually, and it relates to Anya's last uh, point there. It's a question for Monty. Has Efficiency Maine looked at creating a loan loss reserve fund or other credit enhancements that would allow loans to be extended to um, low income households with poor credit scores? Um, well, as of right now, we do have a loan loss reserve. Um, and we, are, we do try to target the low income customers, you know, with the credit score of the 580. You know, that's kind of, if you look at any other, the other in the industry, five, 580 credit score would be pretty, pretty hard to get a loan um, to do anything for. So we, we tried, and we, you know, and we might potentially have other things that might come down the pipeline, but um, that would probably be more of a question for um, Executive Director Michael Stoddard. Okay, and um, I guess the last do we know of other incentives in other markets? I, maybe it's not necessarily for you, Monty, but other folks? It's not that I'm aware of, of other incentives in other markets. Yeah, there's, there's certainly a lot of different programs that have been set up in different states. Um, it's, it's kind of a hodgepodge around the country, um, depending on whether um, programs are run by one of the utilities in a state or by uh, a governor's office of energy or by an independent organization like Efficiency Maine. And so um, I've seen different things. Nevada has a whole different set of programs than, than we do in Maine. And um, certainly um, it's beneficial to look around and see what's working well in other places. But there's, you know, there's a million different programs out there depending how hard you look and uh, it can be hard to sort through all of them and suss out the the differences and um, a lot of them vary depending on the utility rate structures and you know what types of buildings they're trying to address whether it's more on the commercial industrial side or the or the residential side of things um, so yes there's certainly a lot of other options out there um, but some of them wouldn't wouldn't work here or, or wouldn't be a good fit here Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, the other questions honestly are kind of related to the, uh, the larger, some of the larger questions around legislation and um, I don't think I have any other specifics for the panel at the moment. Um, but I'm gonna pose one of the big ones and see what happens. Um, if, if a state, uh, if a state bond issue is not possible, what do we see as attainable funding mechanism given the looming state budget shortfall um, and constitutional requirement of a balanced budget? I don't know if that's for Hannah later or other folks, but that, that is a theme from a couple of people. I think it's gonna really require a lot of private sector um, investment. Um, you know, you see a lot of universities trying to divest of their current portfolios. You see retirement funds also looking to do the same. BlackRock made a big investment uh, announcement um, also indicating the same sort of direction that they're heading with their investments. So I think that there is going to be funding out there additionally um, for this sort of thing. And, you know, like David said, there are a lot of other areas in which they're doing it. Um, for our particular solar project that we're doing here in Freeport, uh, our solar provider sent us a link to a financing opportunity that was actually based in Colorado. I'd much rather participate in a financing opportunity if I was gonna go that route here in Maine. So, um, you know, that's my thought on it from the research that I've done and what I've heard and what's going on out there. Yeah, the, the Connecticut Green Bank, my understanding is they started out in 2011 with $11 million and 100% a, a of it invested was through the state, but now, and as of 2017, they were 43%. So the, that's one of the things I like about the Green Bank is that they do, they're maximizing the state's investment to encourage and jumpstart private investment, like Leanne said, with maybe college funds, anybody looking to divest from fossil fuels, it's local, it actually brings in our local banks, which are all very strong. We have a strong local banking community. So um, I think that's one of the reasons why I look at it and it can continue to not 
necessarily ride on these on these highs and lows of a budget constraint or a change in philosophy at the state level that it can operate as a quasi you know public private financial arm that can continue to grow and invest even more money rather than be hindered by balances of the state budget thank you um we do have one oh, other thing to add to, um, Leanne mentioned the public employee retirement systems and in Maine, our public employee retirement system has a billion dollars invested in fossil fuels. And so if we were to divest that and invest it in green solutions, that would be pretty fantastic. And that's yeah, absolutely. Sure. Billion and, dollars uh, right there. <laughs> Uh, and that, uh, 49 to go. <laughs> in, in Nevada, I can speak to the Nevada Clean Energy Fund, and the state did not allocate any of the general fund budget to the, to the Clean Energy Fund there and did not issue any bonds for it. And they received uh, a grant from a large national nonprofit foundation. Um, and so just this past year, they received millions of dollars to, to be able to actually launch some programs with their Clean Energy Fund. Um, it had been created structurally a couple of years ago and had a board of directors and all that sort of stuff, but wasn't able to actually do any financing because it didn't have funds. And so looking at either uh, national foundations as well as we have some fantastic local foundations across Maine. And so there, there's certainly additional options for that upfront capitalization um, from, from a variety of sources. Um, and so there's, there's options besides um, it being allocated by the legislature, you know, especially this coming year, the, the state budget is going to be really short. And mm -hmm. so there's not going to be funds there. And, uh, and generally there's limitations on bond issuance as well. So, you know, we'll see. Um, but there's, there's certainly a variety of options out there. And we do have um, just two more quick questions. I think we might have time for both. Um, one for Leanne, if air sealing and insulation projects um, kind of pay for themselves and utility savings and loans were more available, do you think homeowners would invest? I absolutely do. In my town, Freeport, we had a promotion not that long ago, Solarize Freeport, and many, many people participated. Um, yeah. It's a no brainer to me, in my opinion. That's one of the first things that um, homeowners will look at or potential homeowners look at is what the utility costs are. And we now have a requirement in our disclosures that we disclose through the Real Estate Commission on our property disclosures when we list a property for sale, what the gallons of consumption of fuel was for the year. So um, home buyers and consumers have become very sensitive to that. And um, that's only accelerating, in my opinion. And they're very, very interested. I can't tell you how, how many people ask me, what are you paying for solar panels? and People are really watching this space very closely. Um, and I think, David, I think we have one more minute. Um, but for Catherine, if funding were available, do you think more developers would overcome that split incentive and make their properties more affordable and healthier? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it just, it, if you could set, even in, in the realm of, say, if there was a green bank that gave me a separate loan at two to three percent on a on a package of upgrades within the insulation window air sealing package. I mean, the amount of pushing and pulling I do to get the maximum with our construction costs is a daily exercise of if I give here, I'll get a little there. And so to take that out and and created at two to three percent it just it's it becomes a no-brainer um and i think that the way the connecticut green bank also pulls in contractors contractors can then also educate their clients on okay here's some upgrades we can do in the air sealing package that will benefit you in the long run um so and as a residential developer i mean that could be a huge opportunity as well. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you everyone on this panel. Um, I really appreciate your, your participation and your input today. 
Um, we're going to take a 10 minute break uh, so that everyone can grab a glass of water or uh, stretch, get away from the computer for a few minutes. Um, so if everyone uh, can make sure to be back at 335 and we'll start the second panel. And in the meantime, we'll try to make sure we've got all the videos up and running for the for the panelists um, after the break. So uh, thank you all very much. And uh, I'll, I'll see everyone back here at 335. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's do it.
All right, I'll unmute the panelists so that we can do a quick sound check. Good afternoon. Hi, David. Hi, Julie. Hi, David. Hey, David. One, two, three. This is Mike Williams. And Julie, you have a few slides. Is that right? Yes. Um, so, yeah. Matt should be able to make you a co host so that you can share your screen. Yeah. Thank you. We'll do that. And I am new to sh screen sharing. Okay. Um, there's I a see. green button at the bottom that says share screen and um, And then when I want to stop sharing, I just click it again. Yeah, it shows up in a different place, but it'll be a red button that says like stop sharing, I think. Okay. Um, and so Matt, if you want to take down the main green bank screen summit screen and we can start the panel. All right. Um, welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're going to start the second panel now. Um, on this one, we have Julie McVay, who is the managing director of Fresh Pond Capital. We have Fortunat Mueller, who is a co founder at Revision Energy. Uh, Tom Murley um, leads Two Lights Energy Advisors and is formerly a board member of the UK Green Investment Bank. Uh, Michael Stoddard is the Executive Director of Efficiency Maine, and Mike Williams is the Deputy Director of the Blue Green Alliance. Um, and so I'll let you each um, say a little bit more to introduce yourselves, um, if you want to go ahead, Julie. Hi, I'm Julie McVeigh. I um, am a co-founder and Managing Director of Fresh Fund Capital, and we are a division with Rinders McVeigh capital management, which is a registered investment advisor committed to socially responsible investing. And we think about socially responsible investing, incorporating our values into our investment selection process, engaging as shareholders, and making direct investments in our community. We manage around $2.4 billion. And we founded Fresh Pond Capital just over 10 years ago with a commitment to justice economic, environmental, racial, and social justice. We work with individuals and families, managing their assets and resources, looking to align with their values. My personal background, I graduated from Bowdoin College in 97. As a transplant from Kansas City, I became a community organizer for the Sierra Club. I ran the uh, Canvas out of the Portland, Maine office. And for the last 20 years have been working in finance and think of myself as a community organizer in money and the justice movement. Awesome. It's great to have you joining us today. Uh, Fortunat, go ahead. Sure. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Thanks for putting this together. 
It's been great so far. I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say. Um, my name is Fortunat Mueller. I'm co-founder, president of Revision Energy. Um, Revision Energy is a Maine-based but regional um, clean energy company. We've been, we founded it in the Midcoast of Maine in 2003, and we now have offices in Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Um, when I say we're a clean energy or an energy transition company, um, that's because while most people know us as a solar company, solar is a big chunk of what we do, but it's not all that we do. We, we do design, develop, build, service solar projects of all sizes from residential up to um, you know, larger commercial uh, DG projects um, and community scale projects. Um, but we also do a variety of other uh, project types, clean energy project types for residential and commercial customers, ranging from air source heat pumps, heat pump water heaters, energy storage, electric vehicle charging. So sort of all the pieces um, that we need to put together to, let, to electrify our economy and to transition to a clean energy economy. And so um, Revision brings those different pieces together um, and um, finance is always a part of every one of those conversations. And so I'm so excited to talk about it here today. Great, thank you. Uh, Tom, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, and and thank you for having me, Doug. It's a it's a re David. It's a real pleasure to be here and to join this group. Uh, my name is Tom Murley, and I started my renewable energy investment career 30 years ago up here in Maine in the biomass sector, uh, working on plants in Livermore Falls, Chester, and Holton. Um, that led me to a career that took me to Europe for 20 years, where I lived in London, where I built one of the largest private equity teams for renewable energy investment. We raised over a billion dollars for projects, wind, solar, hydro, biomass around Europe. That led me to being put on the board of the UK Green Investment Bank. In fact, I helped conceive the bank as one of the task forces that were working on it, joined it at its beginning and sat and chaired its investment committee um, for um, the full seven years before the bank was sold off. During that period of time, the bank invested about three point six billion pounds and about 12 billion pounds worth of projects. Today I'm back in Maine and I do work in the energy transition. I sit on the board of Amoresco, which is the New York Stock Exchange Energy Efficiency Fund. I sit on the board of a Middle Eastern Solar Fund and I'm also sitting on the board of a battery storage fund um, in the UK. So I'm seeing all the aspects of energy storage and transformation these days. Fantastic. Yeah, I didn't even realize all that about you. You have quite the quite the career um uh so uh, michael stoddard do you want to give a bit more of an introduction of yourself sure thanks um thanks david for inviting me and to steve Klemmer for um uh, including us uh, i'm the executive director of the efficiency main trust where i'm coming up uh we are coming up next week on our 10th anniversary so um if we don't show up for work it's probably because we're celebrating uh, raucously in the streets um, I grew up in Brunswick and I live in Portland and uh, I'm an attorney by training, but don't hold that against me. Uh, I have uh, had a really interesting time the last six months being the co-chair of the Buildings, Infrastructure and Housing Working Group in the Maine Climate Council process, along with several people who are on this call today, including Anya and uh, Steve showed up occasionally and I forget who else, but uh, it, was, it was a good, uh, it was a really good process. And we had a lot of discussions around the um, need for and opportunities for a lot more energy efficiency and renewable energy, distributed energy and other kinds of um, distributed resources, uh, improvements in homes and businesses and municipal, uh, municipal buildings and uh, all the tools in the toolbox that could uh, facilitate that uh, and financing is an important one. So um, as we'll talk about in a bit, we have some experience with that, but um, it's probably a bigger role that could be played. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, and then uh, Mike, Mike Williams, go ahead. Thanks, David, I appreciate it. Uh, I really appreciate uh, including me and, and my organization here today. This is a, a great effort you're putting forward. So as David mentioned, I'm Mike, uh, I'm the Deputy Director at the Blue Green Alliance. Those of you who don't know, uh, we are a national partnership of labor unions and environmental organizations. Um, we have staff across the country, uh, offices in DC, Minneapolis, and San Francisco. 
Um, I am based here. I live just north of Portland uh, and I have been for a while. Um, so uh, my work is national, although I have done uh, a bit of work uh, with folks here in Maine, both the labor and the environmental movement here. Um, you know, BGA, we, we put a strong focus into um, how we solve the climate crisis in a manner in which also helps and tries to root out uh, the economic inequality crisis in America. Um, and, you know, especially noting now also the racial justice crisis in America. Um, it's interesting, we'll get into more of this uh, in a moment, uh, but all of the efforts that we want to take on, almost all of them involve uh, efforts that will, that will involve financing and funding and such. And so the discussion around uh, a green bank is, is a really great one, a potent one and a timely one for Maine here. So just appreciate it and look forward to the questions and discussion. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, we're glad to have you involved. Um, so going back to Julie, um, can you give a bit of a description of impact investing um, for anyone who's on this who doesn't understand or, or is not familiar with that term? Sure. Um, we like a definition that actually is really simple, that an impact investment is a direct investment in the community. So I will tease out what it's not, um, as we've seen a big movement and interest in socially responsible investing, more people are co-opting the term impact investment for things that are not that. So for example, secondary market investments, investments in stock markets, that in stocks that are screened with what are called ESG, environmental social uh, governance guidelines, would not in our book be impact investments that they um, don't qualify. Also, it's not gift capital. So these are not gifts made, that these are investments that we expect to recycle back to the investor. Um, and the last piece is that really, we, there are a couple shared um, characteristics that are important to note. One, the primary one is uh, typically there's a lack of liquidity. So the investment in the um, community is serving the community and not necessarily available for the investor. Um, but there's also a spectrum of risk. Some community investments can be very low risk and some are higher risk. Um, there also can be a spectrum of returns. So it's not um, that they're all low return we tend to see the larger the impact for the community in terms of a positive impact, the lower the return, but not necessarily. Great, yeah, thank you. And um, since you've been divested from fossil fuels for a number of years, um, how do the results compare financially um, for accounts that have been divested versus those that, that have fossil fuels in the portfolio? So we have been divested from fossil fuels for a number of years and our portfolios have outperformed our benchmarks. Um, and I can try to screen share our performance um, over the last 10 years. My husband who works with us just noted that um, really the interesting piece is not how have we done as investors, but more how has the S&P 500 done without fossil fuels and noting that when you track S&P 500 without fossil fuels, um, you see that outperformance. So just in, and maybe I should have pulled him on. He's our researcher to understand the notes he just passed me. Um, that energy, if you, there's a website, gofossilfree.org. Energy is only 3% of the S&P 500. It has been down 15% since 1990 and down, I think that's 25% since 1980. Um, our real interest and what we think about is important to note is as long-term investors, we're interested in investing in lasting trends that create a better world. And we really believe that fossil fuels are more of a liability than an asset in a portfolio. Um, we look to avoid liabilities and fossil fuels actually have a number of unusual liabilities. When you think about the world that we're moving into, there's a potential for a carbon tax. That would only hurt fossil fuels. Um, we also are seeing technology rapidly replace commodities. 
that's something that doesn't make an attractive industry to invest in. We're seeing the electric car come around. We're seeing alternative energy options. So you're seeing automation in uh, manufacturing. There are a number of just innovations that ultimately are making fossil fuel investing more of dinosaur investing and looking backwards. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and then just quickly, are you seeing many other investors shifting their investments from fossil fuels to clean energy? We are. I mean, as a whole, and I don't have statistics here other than I think it's since 2016, um, almost a trillion dollars has moved into the social responsible investing mutual fund. So that's not even all of the space, but that's one measure. You're seeing the same wakening up of um, kind of you're seeing of mainstream and humanity people are now bringing to their investments and saying, actually, these go hand in hand, that values and investing um, should not be separated. One last point, just to Anya Wright's point of um, how do we address systems that really have furthered inequities? I do think there's a, a piece of recognizing that stock market investing, while Many of us cannot divest completely from the stock market. It is a system um, with inequities built into it. And so as much as we can hold and um, in our portfolios that doing one thing with our left hand and investing in really the revolution that's going to take root and lead us into the new world we wanna live in. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm a, I'm a big fan of socially responsible investment. I've transitioned all of my retirement funds over into uh, clean funds that, that don't have fossil fuel investments. And one of them I even divested to invest in solar on my own home to start to see some of the benefit now um, as well as well into the future. Um, thank you very much, Julie. And um, with that, I'll turn to Fortunat. And, uh, Fortunat, how do you see increased access to capital benefiting Revision's customers as well as main solar industry? Um, it's a good question, David. I think uh, we heard, I think previously Abe said, you know, the green bank is intended to be additive um, and has been most successful where it is thought of that way. Um, in the solar space, there are portions of the solar space where the you know, financing options for customers are really robust. And so those include, for example, um, uh, you know, relatively affluent homeowners with high credit scores. So if you, you know, if you own a, you know, above average value home um, and have a good job um, and a good solid credit score, you know, you can get a loan for a solar project at very competitive prices from a number of places. We partner with a local credit union. We partner with a couple of uh, national lenders to provide residential solar financing for projects that, as you know, David, that you know, they instantly pay for themselves um, in almost every case here in Maine. Um, likewise, if you are a large municipality with a very large electric load, you know, a million kilowatt hours a year or more, and are looking to offset that whole load, there are some really robust third party ownership options, PPAs, and lots of capital, lots of providers looking to finance those projects at favorable rates. Um, but there are also really vast parts of the market that are uh, where there are gaps in financing. Um, and, and like Mike said, um, Revision has a focus on making sure that we not only um, implement the clean energy transition, but that it be a just transition and that it lift up the communities that we live in. And that means it needs to be an inclusive transition as well, right? And so we need financing options that work for everybody. Um, and I think that's where the Green Bank really has, <clears throat> um, can do the, can have the biggest impact. Um, in particular, some of the things we've heard about already, um, you know, low and moderate income homeowners, of which there are a lot in Maine, who, who do own their own home, but don't necessarily own a home that has a lot of value and may or may not have an excellent credit score for a variety of reasons. Um, you know, as, uh, as Monty said, there are some efficiency main loan options that go down to 580 in credit score, but you only get a couple thousand dollars. Not gonna buy a solar project with a couple thousand dollars, right? And so extending solar financing sort of to those parts of the residential market um, could be a pretty big um, and attractive option for those customers. Um, likewise, we heard from Catherine and, and others earlier, 
that in the commercial space, you know, either if you are not owner occupied, so if you have a tenant that is separate from the, from the landlord, um, or if you are just a medium sized business and not particularly a, a big business, um, that financing can be challenging for those companies. Again, large businesses, large successful businesses who own their own real estate can finance solar because they have tons of access to capital. Capital right now in the economy is fairly available and cheap. Um, but it is, it is um, unevenly distributed. So I think that's where the real opportunity is for the Green Bank. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, how, how would you envision a Green Bank or, or other new financing programs helping with deployment of battery storage, electric vehicles, and other new technologies um, that are really just in their infancy at this point? Um, I think it's really useful to think back, you know, in the, think back in the solar market 10 years and think about the, the scarcity of solar finance options 10 years ago. Um, and and um, that is sort of the challenge that energy storage has today or that to some degree electric vehicle charging infrastructure has today in that they are not yet as de-risked as solar. So I mean, the reason solar financing is available to the, to the entities I mentioned before is because um, the industry, the technology, sort of the revenue models have been substantially de-risked for, for the purpose of, of the lenders. Um, that's not necessarily true yet for storage, especially commercial storage. Um, and so I think, um, you know, a, a bank or a, you know, I don't know if it's a bank, a lending institution or a finance, or a, or a finance vehicle that um, explicitly has a goal of sort of advancing technology um, may have more appetite to make investments sort of on the margins on the slightly less mature technology, which is where we need it to drive that stuff forward. So, you know, once it's perfectly safe and everybody knows it's going to save money and the, and the lenders and the borrowers almost never default, well, then we no longer need um, a green bank. And frankly, we don't longer need Efficiency Maine to loan on those projects either because every bank in the world wants to loan on those. Right? You go talk to the credit unions who loan on solar and they say, this is an awesome product for us. We have zero defaults. We have you know, millions and millions of dollars of loans out and we have zero delinquencies and defaults. Um, what we need, I think, in the public policy space is to lend sort of in an additive way to bring financing to those markets, again, in those technologies that are not yet mature. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, Julie, I saw your hand. Did you want to add something? I I just wanted to give you a, a better statistic for um, actually how much money has committed to divest from fossil fuels. So I do have that here, 14 trillion in assets have committed to divest from fossil fuels. Of the 1,237 institutions, 13% of those are pension funds. So as 32% um, are faith-based, 15% philanthropic. So a number to keep in mind. Yeah, wow. Lots of lots of money out there moving into better things. Um, so, um, Tom, uh, can you describe some of the projects that the UK Green Investment Bank helped to fund? And you're muted, so unmute yourself. There we go. Certainly. One thing I just wanted to address before that, though, is was Fortunate's comment on storage and being with one of the first storage investment funds, the, the issue is not really some of the technology unfamiliarity, it's the uncertainty about the long-term revenue stream. Most storage projects don't benefit from a, you know, a 15 or a 20 year financing through a um, net metering program or a feed-in tariff or something. So you're looking at large capital investments with an uncertain revenue stream, and that's what's holding a lot of people up and that's what's held up the banks, which is why it's being funded in Europe almost entirely by equity capitalization. So it's, it, it's less of a problem. It's a problem with the revenue model that is attached to storage these days at a grid scale. There's an interesting company in California that is putting them in municipal buildings and doing time of day arbitrage on electricity. And municipal buildings can save 50, 70, maybe 100,000 in their... Um, by using this, you know, they decide in a half hour increment, do I charge the battery? Do I discharge the battery? Do I buy from the grid through the control system? It's more of a software play. But coming back to the UK, I think it's important to note that 
the UK, the world's first green investment bank, was also born out of a financial crisis. And after 2008, there was a lack of investment for UK and its green ambitions. And so that came to fruition in 2010 and the bank was formed in 2011. And what was important to say was what were the options then? Solar was still very expensive and rooftop solar didn't have penetration and didn't make a lot of economic sense. Um, not just in England because it wasn't sunny, but because just where the costs were in the sector at that time. And the UK's push was primarily on larger infrastructure, but also where well, I say energy savings, the average home in the UK, you know, you think the main homes are poorly insulated. It's 10 times worse in the UK, believe it or not. So there is a focus on that. So the Green Bank was set up to do four specific things out of a wide range of things that were considered. Yeah, you know, some people said we should do venture capital. Some people we should give grants away, but it was decided to be set up to invest for a return, the ability to recycle that capital, focusing on offshore wind, where the UK was probably the most successful. It became the largest investor in offshore wind and really proved to the private sector that offshore wind was available for financial institutions. And that resulted not only in us investing in it, but then creating a billion pound fund with other capital to invest alongside of us. So that was a real success story. The second thing we invested in was community scale renewables. We saw a niche in the market where, you know, a, a, mega, you know, a five megawatt solar farm or wind farm necessary on a community scale wasn't getting financing. So we stepped into that area and had success. We did LED street lighting conversions, uh, mostly with larger scale municipalities at a point when that was pretty new. And then we did biomass and waste energy projects. And in all of these things, we had the ability to invest in either debt or in equity or in a combination of the two. Um, and so those are the things we did. Again, our biggest successes were probably in offshore wind and in the biomass and the waste energy sector. Although the LED street lighting, I think we did pioneer the way and we're seeing a lot more of that move forward these days. Yeah, fantastic. No, those are uh, LED street lights. I, I have some experience with those and something that uh, initially they weren't as robust as needed, particularly in Southern Nevada in the desert. Um, they, they didn't hold up, but the newer technologies have really come a long way and, and there's just tremendous energy savings available. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, I think it's safe to say, Tom, that you have the most experience of anyone in Maine when it comes to leading a green bank. Um, what advice would you have for Maine as things get started here? I think, I think the most important thing is, there are a couple things. I think one is focus. Um, I said, when the, when the UK was a serious green bank, there are a lot of people coming in saying, do all of this. And what happened through the government process and setting up, it wasn't left for the green bank to decide where the need was. The government and the industry sector and the finance worked together and say, where are the needs? And we came up with those four areas, offshore wind, street lighting. We did come up with something to deal with the home insulation problem in the UK. And that's the one place where we did not succeed. It was an attempt to create a finance vehicle for people retrofitting homes. And that just proved to be too hard. And we ended up being unable to really back that program for a variety of reasons. Some of it were credit orientated, some of it were cost of capital orientated uh, problems. But we had a very clear focus as to what we could do. And the clear objective was to, to invest in the, that largely infrastructure, to do that, making sure we brought along private sector capital in each investment, which we did. And it was all designed to lower carbon emissions. And it can become very attractive with a green bank to hang a lot of other ornaments on the tree. And you know, I agree with creating more jobs in Maine, but the Green Bank, we didn't have a job creation mandate. You know, we were doing offshore wind, the equipment comes from Germany, let's be honest, um, or from uh, a lot of the stuff comes from Norway. So we didn't have that, we were focused on greening the economy, greening the energy sector without trying to hang a lot of other ornaments on it. And I think a lot of organizations that I've seen that try and hang a lot of those other ornaments can often get lost and be unable to deliver on any of their objectives. So that focus is important. The second thing was independence. The government having set it up and owning 100% of the bank, 
set it up with an independent board of directors. It was chaired by one of the greatest businessmen I've ever come to know, uh, Lord Smith of Kelvin. We had on the board the, the head of one of the largest insurance companies. We had a retired partner from one of the big three accounting firms. I was leading my energy investment fund. Uh, we had on it one of the first, a woman who's one of the creators of the first green funds for Jupiter Asset Management. Um, and in some ways the godmother of, of green investing, a woman named Tessa Tennant. So as a group is independent, we had one government representative on the board that represented the shareholder executive, but the government didn't interfere in investment decisions. So we didn't have a political board, which meant we just made the investment decisions without someone saying, I got this pet project in my constituency or you know, my hometown, I want you to do something. And that led us to be the largest investor in the UK green space inside of 18 months of formation, largely because of that independence. Um, I think the other thing was focusing on, you know, it's on capital, it's, you know, capital, enough capital that makes a difference, and then focus on an area where the problem is actually fixable. Um, I think in time, the green banks can move on to maybe doing some harder things, but it was important in the UK that we got some early wins and shown that we were making a difference not that we were writing off capital because that allowed us to get more money from the government. So you want to use sectors that you can fix the problems where it's truly finance, but we decided definitely not to be a technology investor because we didn't know if we could fix that problem. And the worst thing that could happen for the bank would have been to have write-offs in a risky area, which would have cut off more funds from the government. And in the end of the day, that's worked. So for me, it's, it's focused with clear objectives. It's a level of independence a good amount of capital and focusing that capital where it can make a difference. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's, that's certainly great advice. Thank you. Um, so Michael, um, there was a bill this year for commercial property assessed clean energy. Um, could you describe what that is and, and give a, a little bit of an overview of how um, commercial pace would benefit Maine? Sure. Thanks, David. Uh, so the PACE concept, uh, the PACE is, is an acronym for Property Assessed Clean Energy, P-A-C-E. And the idea is that it's differentiated from other types of loans because the loan is secured against the property and, it, the, and it's part of the, uh, it's collected through the tax assessment. So um, that, among other things, gives it priority status as a lien, um, first priority status. And that has been a source of a fair amount of controversy over the last decade when it was first introduced in Maine and other states 10 years ago. The mortgage industry said that that was a non-starter. Um, they were in crisis at that time and it was not going to work for them to have new loans parachuting into first position in front of them. Um, uh, Rob Wood, who I believe is on this call, uh, worked tirelessly over the last couple of years with a lot of stakeholders, including bank industry, um, the uh, uh, credit unions, uh, realtors, and others to figure out ways to tweak the language of the legislation so that uh, there would be sort of a sign-off process where the uh, the mortgage holders would have to uh, consent to letting these other PACE loans go in first position. So the idea with these is uh, that they would be limited to non-residential. So this would be a, a complement to the kinds of loan products that were talked about in the first session, focusing on residential, uh, most of them were focusing on residential. This would focus on commercial, other non-residential municipal. Um, and uh, there would be, I think the, the, it's envisioned that the capital would come from the private sector, from um, banks that were interested in loaning to these products. But the, the trick is that you'd have Efficiency Maine, presumably, playing um, a facilitator role to uh, do some vetting of the proposed projects to confirm that they have a savings to investment ratio that's positive. In other words, that they're gonna save more money than they, than they cost in monthly payments. And if that standard could be met, then 
the idea is that it would uh, kind of get the stamp of approval, the imprimatur from Efficiency Maine, and then would be put out to the marketplace where um, private investors could choose if they wanted to finance the loan. So I, I think that's the basic model, and I, I would be at risk of guessing and making stuff up if I were to get any more detail than that, so I will, I will resist that temptation. Um, it, it got very far through the legislature last uh, spring, this spring, but obviously um, things changed when coronavirus came along, and so it did not ultimately get enacted, and we'll see where that goes. Um, Rob may be able to speak to that better than I. But it would be a nice compliment uh, to have in Maine, I think, for all the reasons that other panelists have said, um, particularly, I think, uh, an obvious candidate that's struggling to finance things would be the municipalities. Um, I also want to comment, though, that I think we should go into this with our eyes open. Um, this is going to be a really unusual time economically. Um, we went through something like this 10 years ago. And um, I can tell you from firsthand experience, we couldn't get people to take loans. They did not want to have any debt at all. Um, it didn't matter to them that they were going to get to pay it back over time. So especially with uh, for-profit entities, they're really skittish usually in these kinds of uh, economic situations. And so I don't, I don't know what we're going to find when we get out there. On the other hand, um, whether it's with this product or any of the usual um, financial incentives that we offer, we, there are going to be some uh, businesses and some municipalities that have to make investments. Uh, there's going to be equipment they have that uh, burns out and needs to be replaced. There will be some new construction projects uh, and renovation projects. And, and when they have those opportunities to decide what it is they want to heat and ventilate their, their buildings with and how they want to uh, design and insulate the building shells and whether they want to put PV on the roof, et cetera, they're going to have some choices to make and we want to be there to help them make the best uh, long-term decisions they can. So whether it's just with the financial incentives we do have funding for, or whether there's some additional kind of financing tool at our disposal, um, we're going to want to we're going to want to help them at that moment. Um, I, I yeah. so I, I, that's sort of uh, at a high level. I, I also want to mention uh, this maybe is getting closer to where Tom was coming from and what he experienced in Europe, but. You know, uh, anyone who participated in the recent rounds of discussions in the working groups of the Maine Climate Council, uh, I don't think they could have failed to be impressed by the magnitude of investment that was being discussed from in the energy working group and in the buildings working group. We're talking about massive transformation of most everything on the customer side of the meter, most everything um, that is in homes and businesses that we use for heating and cooling our buildings, um, the, mo the majority of which is now coming from heating oil and in the future it's going to have to come from something that is practically zero carbon and that's likely to include a lot of heat pump technology for uh, water heating and space heating. The good news is we, we know that that technology exists, but that's a massive investment to convert all that equipment over the next 30 years. Um, yep. But similarly, the grid that we have that is going to supply those um, those end uses as and electric vehicles as well is not sized to do that job today. So uh, the grid will need to be invested in and then also the generation to feed the grid, to feed the <laughs> heat pumps and the heat pump water heaters and the electric vehicles. Uh, so all of that is going to need um, a major amount of investment. And I think, you know, you're part here of a really interesting conversation that we're going to have to keep having about how we finance all this uh, affordably and wisely, uh, mm -hmm. and, but also in a timely fashion. We can't wait around. We got to really um, accelerate the rate of investment. Yeah. Well, I'm going to pause you there and, and turn to Mike Williams. Um, we have a few minutes left in the panel, so we probably aren't going to have time for any questions from uh, the audience today on, on this panel. Um, 
but uh, Mike, um, with the creation of a green bank or other public financing programs, uh, what would you like to see happen to make sure that the public interest is kept at the forefront? Yeah, I appreciate that question, David. Um, and I think it, so it's one thing I, I wanted to note. So Tom had mentioned worrying about ornaments, uh, quote unquote, uh, being put on it. Um, I respectfully yet strongly disagree with that point. Um, the public, we're spending public dollars here, uh, especially if we're thinking about public financing, um, you know, bonding or however we're gonna capitalize this effort. Um, it should, the dollar should be made in the public interest. And what that means is that we should be considering things like how is this gonna affect working Mainers, working people across Maine, people from disadvantaged communities. How are we lifting them up while we're also uh, supporting the build out of renewable energy and energy efficiency projects? So uh, carbon emissions reductions, absolutely critical. And that should be a core fundamental element of it. But there are so many other parts to this that as we spend money, uh, we should be doing it in the right way. And what that means is uh, effectively there's, you know, either you know, strings attached of some kind, whether there's mandates, prioritization of the funding or financing, um, or at the very least basic guidelines um, and recommendations on how the financing or the funding would come out of this. And there's, there's a list of ways this could happen. You know, there's really interesting complex uh, procurement um, methods that have been done um, in, in California or with the, uh, the Chicago Metro, um, uh, they're buying Metro cars effectively. And so they put forward an effort called an, a, an employment plan. And so you had to fill out a scorecard and what led to that was, and yes, there are strings attached, but they got the job done. Uh, they delivered the rail cars and it helped bring rail car manufacturing back to the U S that hired people from disadvantaged communities. This is, this is what we should be doing with public dollars. We should be lifting up communities, lifting up working people while we're solving climate change. Um, you know, there's, there's a litany of other pieces that, that should just be no brainers. Prevailing wages, we should never be giving public dollars if we're not at least paying, paying the prevailing wage. Uh, we should consider things like local hire, targeted hire, where it makes sense. I understand, you know, with labor markets and employment markets, we have to have flexibility, but we should be striving to be hiring local mainers. Uh, and be and making sure that when we're investing these funds, they go to, you know, good business owners like Fortunate and not just Wall Street financiers. Uh, this should be kept in Maine. This should be supported, supporting Maine workers. That that's that's the goal. Should be the goal of this. So uh, again, this this is not just an important aside tangential thing. This is core to what we should be thinking about when we're doing something like this because it's going to cost us a lot of money, a lot of taxpayer dollars to do this if we want to do it right. And we should do it right, completely. Consider the equity elements, consider uh, the economic justice elements in all of this. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you and, and sorry uh, that we don't have time for additional questions from the, from the audience. Um, but I, I do wanna keep to the schedule here. Um, and clearly there's a lot of different considerations and, and we'll, further discussions are absolutely needed to you know, make sure that we're doing things in the right way and um, and getting to the right solutions. Um, so if all of you, uh, thank you all very much for participating today. And um, we'll turn to Hannah Pingree, uh, who is the director of the governor's office, uh, governor's office of Policy, Innovation, and the Future. And um, thank you, Hannah, for joining us today. And it looks like the other panelists are turning off their video, so you'll be the featured speaker. Great. All right. Um, just going to click here. Can you see my slides? Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to be um, very quick because I know that the uh, main event is really to hear from uh, Brian and Bert, um, who are zooming in from Connecticut. Um, and I think all of us are especially interested in the Connecticut example, which has been um, the pioneering and most successful green bank in the country. Um, but David asked me to sort of briefly ground what we are talking about here today in the Maine Climate Council, which is um, has been mentioned uh, several times since I joined the call and I know is really the place where we're talking about a lot of the required adaptation and clean energy investments that are needed to meet the state's climate goals. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to share a whole long presentation, but just a couple quick slides 
on the status of where we are because we are um, we do have green bank um, discussions um, on our plate um, and how we fund all of the work required for climate transition is probably the most important question and becomes even more important in a time of economic uncertainty. Um, so I'm just gonna quickly uh, run through that. Um, so just to, for, for most people know, I've looked quickly through this call and I actually see a number of our co-chairs, our staff, um, state representatives, senators. So thank you all for joining. And I know most of you are quite familiar with what the Maine Climate Council is doing. Um, so we have a challenge of helping um, to prepare Maine um, uh, to be more resilient to the impacts of climate change and to also achieve the following goals. Um, the governor has required us to achieve net neutrality um, by executive order. And then the two legal goals, which are paramount to all of our work, which is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by 45% by 2030 and 80%, at least 80% um, by 2050. So just a quick where we are. Um, we are currently, um, as of the last DEP report, um, two years ago and another report's coming out this next year, um, we are 17 um, and a half percent uh, below 1990 levels. So we have work to do before 2030 um, and obviously significant work to do before 2050. Um, I think many of you have understand clearly the, the state's uh, emissions challenge. Uh, we are um, probably somewhat unique in our significant amount of our greenhouse gas emissions that come from transportation. Um, but residential um, and commercial buildings as well as industrial are, are the really remaining part of the mix and then the electricity sector. So where we are, the Maine Climate Council kicked off um, this uh, past uh, September and we worked uh, through the winter and spring turning to virtual work um, to come up with recommendations on how we achieve the state's ambitious goals. Um, we just wrapped up a two-day meeting last week um, where all of the working groups laid out their strategies um, for how we meet the state's goals. We are meeting, um, spending the summer doing a, a little bit of work that I'm gonna talk about quickly, and we have uh, our report due by December 1st. So the work was done. Um, our kind of leading group is the Science and Technical Subcommittee under the Climate Council. Um, I know Ivan Fernandez, one of the co-chairs, is buried somewhere here on this call. Um, science is paramount. Um, and then we have these uh, six groups, each of which were required to make recommendations um, on, on how to tackle both the adaptation and the mit mitigation challenges of climate for Maine. So I'm not gonna read through all of the recommendations, um, but the groups did incredible work um, with a ton of stakeholders, a ton of uh, good thinking on how we transform um, the three major sectors that produce emissions, um, as well as how we help prepare our communities to be more resilient. Um, so these, these are the three uh, sort of buckets of recommendations um, in the mitigation sectors. Um, really good work and these kind of quick bullet points don't begin to sort of tell the whole story. Um, you can find it all, I'll show you our website. You can find their full reports, which I know Michael Starr wants you to read um, uh, later tonight. Um, but they are on our website. Um, but every single, the vast majority of these strategies require um, funding mechanisms. The Green Bank um, came up as one of the concepts as a funding mechanism in, in at least two, if not um, three of our working groups. Um, here are the three working groups who did uh, both resilience and adaptation as well as some mitigation work. Um, again, uh, we, Michael talked about the significant um, cost challenge for transforming the electricity sector, for, um, for uh, making our, our homes and our buildings more efficient, our transportation infrastructure, but the challenges of preparing, um, for example, our coast or our floodplain areas um, for some of the kinds of effects they'll see from sea level rise or weather events um, actually make, makes those costs even look small. So huge amount of infrastructure needs um, for a state like Maine. So I would just um, say that we are really deep into this work. Over the summer, we are undertaking a significant public engagement process that's gonna kick off uh, the second week of July. Um, we are doing more thorough modeling um, and cost benefit analysis. And then really, again, core to 
the work, the discussion uh, this afternoon, a funding analysis of how, what are the mechanisms um, to pay for the kinds of solutions um, that have been laid out. Um, we're also working on an equity assessment um, with the Mitchell Center, uh, really making sure that equity is at the heart of our work. Um, so just if you want to learn more, um, climatecouncil.maine.gov is our new website. It's being um, updated with the information from last week as we speak. And again, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll have a more um, robust mechanism for, for folks to really weigh in, tell us what we're missing, um, help prioritize what's most important to them and their community, um, and also um, find ways to engage uh, their families, their friends, and those people who don't agree with us, who we still want to make sure we're having a, a conversation with. So um, I, I would say the Climate Council's work is really, um, I know everybody on this call sort of understands the challenge of climate for our, our world, our state, uh, and our country. I think um, Maine has really taken a, a pioneering uh, look and at with our aggressive goals, with our um, sort of one of our leading, um, one of the country's leading renewable portfolio standards, um, the heat pump program, which I think Michael briefly mentioned, but leading the country on heat pump installations. Um, so there's a lot of exciting work happening in Maine, um, but a lot to do and a lot to do to meet the kinds of goals that we need to meet um, with, a, with a plan by the end of the year. So I, I would say with that, it's kind of a perfect segue to um, the two speakers who are coming up, um, we have uh, Brian Garcia, who is the president and CEO of uh, the Maine Green Bank, um, sorry, the Connecticut Green Bank, and Bert Hunter, who is the executive vice president and the chief investment officer um, of the Connecticut Green Bank. So I have had the pleasure of, of um, hearing um, at least Brian on a couple of U.S. Climate Alliance calls. Um, the uh, main joined the U.S. Climate Alliance, a group of 25 states who are still working to meet the Paris um, Climate Accords, um, despite our federal government's inaction. Um, so we have really followed what Connecticut has done. Uh, the Green Bank um, is the first and oldest Green Bank in the country. They've done some incredible work. Um, they won the 2017 Har Harvard Kennedy School um, Government and Innovation Award. So um, it's really exciting to have them here this afternoon, and I will pass it off to them. Anna, great. Thank you. That, that, that was great. And, and as I was hearing you talk uh, about the process that Maine is undertaking to get its arms around addressing climate change uh, from a mitigation and adaptation perspective. It's, it was great to see that. I was immediately thinking about our climate finance working group underneath the USCA and how we are really, th there's really a need to continue to learn together, uh, specifically around how we finance adaptation. Um, so I'm excited to be working with you and others. I know we're going to start to bring more uh, content to the group on that. Um, so. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Brian Garcia, President and CEO of the Connecticut Green Bank. Um, I wanted to, to thank uh, David Gibson for the invitation for Bert and I uh, to be with you here this afternoon. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be with you Mainers. Um, for over a decade, uh, my husband and I uh, had a home on Moosehead Lake in Greenville, Maine. So uh, a big shout out to Camp Camp, Flatlanders, Northwoods Outfitters, you know, Maine holds a special place uh, in our heart. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge Michael Stoddard uh, from Efficiency Maine. Uh, you Mainers might not know it, uh, but it was Michael uh, and his colleague Dan Soslin who, uh, through Environment Northeast, uh, now the Acadia Center, uh, led the charge to create the system benefit fund that the Connecticut Green Bank now administers today, uh, the Clean Energy Fund. So Michael, it's, it's great to see you again. Uh, we need to catch up. Um, so, so it's great to be with all of you. I'm joined uh, by Bert Hunter, uh, our Executive Vice President and Chief Investment Officer of the Connecticut Green Bank. Uh, he's going to walk us through a few Green Bank transactions, uh, including CPACE, uh, solar and energy efficiency for low-income households. So we are going to uh, address the issue of vulnerable communities and how clean energy can uh, make America better. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk a bit about a food waste uh, to energy anaerobic digester project as well, just to give you a sense for how the Green Bank model uh, can apply to different areas of our green economy. 
Uh, so we're going to tag team uh, on this presentation. All right. Um, so just uh, quickly in terms of who the Connecticut Green Bank is. So our mission, and this has evolved over time, um, our mission is to confront climate change. We, we just set it aside. You know, this is the, the biggest challenge we have in front of us. Um, so we need to mobilize massive amounts of investment to address the climate problem. Uh, we also want to ensure that while we're doing that, we are providing all of society a healthier and more prosperous future in all if I could emphasize it more, I would, I, I, you know, I, I should color it differently. I should make it bigger. Uh, but this is really about um, lifting everybody up. This is an equity issue. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, we focus on increasing and accelerating the flow of private capital. So how can we take the limited amount of ratepayer and public dollars that we have to scale up and increase uh, the level of investment from uh, private sources. Uh, we're never going to solve our climate problem on the backs of government. We need to mobilize massive amounts of, of investment uh, and ultimately to energize the green economy. So this is about growth uh, and working towards a new a vision for an economy that uh, we all uh, can embrace. Uh, we do that through three goals. When people think about green banks, they generally think about how we mobilize private investment in economies. Uh, but we're also here to strengthen our communities and make sure that the benefits of the green economy are inclusive and accessible to all individuals, families, and businesses. I'll talk about some of those social and environmental uh, benefits in a second. Uh, and then lastly is to pursue investment strategies that advance market transformation and green investing. I'm going to talk about Green Bank 2.0 and something that we're about to uh, issue next week. Uh, so you're kind of getting the first uh, message on this. Uh, while also supporting the organization's pursuit of financial sustainability. So that is really important in the context of a quasi-public organization that is supported by uh, ratepayer funds, public funds, especially in the context of a budget environment where our states have been really hammered by COVID-19. So we're in a really sensitive spot in terms of how our legislative leaders are looking at budgets and filling budget gaps. Um, so let me start off just quickly in terms of uh, what we're trying to do for end-use customers. And, and this may differ. You know, your value proposition in Maine may be different from what it is in Connecticut. But our whole goal is to reduce energy burden, which is to reduce the amount households are paying, businesses are paying for energy by, putting, by providing them capital to finance clean energy improvements so that they have cash in their pockets immediately. So if, if you take a, a bill before clean energy, our goal is to finance as many clean energy improvements as we can through various programs, we'll talk about that, uh, to ultimately lower what they are spending to the utility or on energy, as well as debt service, so that at the end of the day, there's cash going back into their pockets. We wanna make this an economic proposition to our end use customers. Um, so. When we, we know as we deliver more clean energy deployment, we get the cleaner, reliable, healthier benefits that we want to see from these technologies. And at the end of the day, we want to make it uh, more economical to those end use consumers so that they demand more of it. We accelerate growth and uptake uh, of these technologies. Um, in terms of, you probably got a little bit of this from Abe earlier, in terms of what green banks uh, try to do. So this is uh, a diagram that tries to show uh, how we take uh, public or ratepayer funds and have conversations with private investors about how we can get their capital invested in the clean energy economy of our state in Connecticut in this context. So we're doing what we can to mitigate risk. We want to put money into projects. We want to see multiples of their money coming into these projects. It may be that the green bank is subordinated in these transactions, meaning we take the first losses. That, that usually is what the private investors want. They want risk mitigation. Uh, we're willing to do that. And knock on wood, we see great performance. Happy to talk about that. Uh, people pay for their uh, financing uh, uh, loans and leases uh, when it deals with energy. They just pay for it. So uh, we know over time, as people pay those uh, loans and leases back to private investors in the green bank that what we get from it is more social and environmental return so we are all about uh societal profit maximization um to give you a sense of 
some of the things we target, number one is it's driven by investment. So the more capital we have coming into Connecticut's green economy, the better. And we're going to try to uh, stimulate and catalyze as much of that capital as we can. Uh, so these are some new numbers. We're about to close our fiscal year, uh, but we're in uh, our, we were started up in July of 2011. So we're at our ninth year um, as an organization. Um, we've mobilized nearly $2.2 billion of investment in Connecticut's green economy by investing $280 million of public and ratepayer resources. And what I can tell you is that the public resources that we have uh, have been loaned out. So we're getting the principal interest back from that payment over time, which is great, but it also makes a target for legislative leaders who need, now need to plug budget gaps. So kind of managing your capital and building a strong financial foundation is important, especially when you need to partner with uh, private investors to uh, mobilize investment. Uh, more investment creates tax revenues. We know individuals, corporations, sales tax, the, that's kind of uh, the foundation to our governments and essential services. So the more clean energy that's deployed, the more investment that comes in, the more tax revenues that come back to the state. Uh, we know jobs are created from that. Uh, the jobs that are created that deploy clean energy are reducing the burden of energy costs on our families and businesses. Uh, especially our most vulnerable, we want to see the affordability gap for energy be closed uh, so that they can spend more of their household income on the things that are important to them. Uh, it's not energy. Uh, things that are important to them are health care, uh, education, uh, you know, those sorts of things. So the more money we can put back in uh, their pockets through uh, clean energy, the better. Uh, and then, of course, we get all the things that we're all after uh, as environmentalists, conservationists. Um, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We reduce local air pollution. Uh, we actually can model um, what the associated public health benefits are uh, from a local reduction uh, or avoidance of particulate matter, SOX, NOx, uh, and all that results in um, improved public health. Um, so uh, these are just a, a snapshot of some of the metrics. Uh, we are working on some equity metrics now. Uh, specifically around uh, income and race. Um, so stay tuned in the coming year, uh, we'll start to roll out uh, some of those metrics. But as Hannah noted, uh, as a result of helping to be a catalyst for the Green Bank movement in the US in 2017, we were uh, awarded the Innovation and in American Government Awards uh, by the Kennedy School. Um, so, so with that, I, I, I thought we would talk a little bit now about the, the what we do and how we do it. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Bert, and he's going to walk through a couple of transactions just to give you a sense for how the green bank model uh, gets applied uh, within uh, the green industry. All right, Bert, I'm going to turn it to you. Thank you, Brian. Can, it, can you hear me? Yeah, you're perfect, Bert. Oh, okay. You were coming through a little bit scratchy there, so, um, so uh, let's hope the, uh, the audio keeps up. So, uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Bert Hunter, Chief Investment Officer for the Connecticut Green Bank. And um, yes, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been quite quite interesting. I am not going to start my video. And the reason is because I am actually tethered to my cell phone. Uh, I lost uh, Wi-Fi, so I'm sorry I won't be able to, uh, to do that. But I did get your request to start video, so I won't be doing that. Um, so... Uh, commercial PACE was one of the first programs that the Green Bank embarked upon uh, when uh, we started uh, back in uh, 2011. And actually, the legislation for commercial PACE came into being uh, in 2012. Uh, we were not the first uh, commercial PACE program in the country. In fact, I think we were approximately number 27 or 28 in the country. But uh, we um, got out of the blocks very quickly uh, because of a philosophy that we adopted pretty early on, which was to take the long view of these programs and to try to build the program from a perspective of having private capital uh, be really the prime mover in the overall program. When commercial PACE was established in Connecticut, we were designated as the statewide administrator which uh, made sense because you know, Connecticut is not a very large state, three and a half million people. You can pretty much drive across the state 
in, uh, in three hours uh, from corner to corner. Uh, so it, it made sense to have a statewide administrator and that gave us the ability to uh, not only set up the program, but when it came to uh, trying to invite private capital into the program, uh, we could set standards uh, that uh, would resonate with the private capital market and, uh, and, and get, uh, get money into uh, our market for clean energy and energy efficiency. Um, we did uh, step into uh, providing capital ourselves and the reason for that was because um, we thought we were going to build a field of dreams, you know, build it and they will come. Well, we, we set everything up and it was crickets. Uh, and, and there was no one in the marketplace was willing to take the first step in doing the first steep pace projects um, because it was, our, our structure was untested. So we decided to use cash from our balance sheet to invest in the commercial pace program. And we did that though, after uh, working with the private sector in developing uh, financing agreements that uh, met their requirements. So after uh, a number of months of back and forth with capital providers and their legal counsel, we came up with a standard financing agreement, which has been modified slightly over time, improved uh, catching little uh, imperfections that, uh, uh, that we discovered over time. But we started to uh, provide uh, financing into the marketplace and at the same time, we discovered uh, since we were putting together our solar fund, not only for residential properties, but we put that solar fund together to be able to uh, uh, underwrite and invest in commercial properties, uh, commercial prop scale transactions, everything from, from schools, municipal buildings, um, uh, and, and, but we also wanted to get into, uh, open the market for regular small and medium businesses to be able to have the benefits of, uh, of solar PV, you know, the lower cost of energy that that would produce, as well as obviously the clean energy benefits that it would produce. The problem being with uh, using a solar lease or a solar power purchase agreement, which we have today, uh, is that it's very hard to take a 20 year view on the sustainability of a business, of a small, medium business. Uh, what commercial pace allowed us to do was to secure that power purchase agreement uh, through the commercial pace system so that you really could just uh, take a long view on the sustainability of the property, being the value of the property itself, which is how CPACE works, and no matter whether that business would be there for five years or 20 years or 30 years, it didn't matter because you were underwriting to a combination of the present occupant of the property as well as to the real estate. So that was a magic moment for the program where we now were uh, armed with both a financing agreement to do pure energy efficiency, as well as a power purchase agreement that we could secure through our commercial pace program, which literally blew the doors off of, of the, uh, the entire program and, and capital uh, started to, uh, to really go into many projects uh, faster than any other program in, in the country in commercial pace. And for, uh, for quite some time, we were the, the largest um, market for, uh, for commercial pace, and to this day, we're certainly uh, one of the top five. Um, but uh, California has overtaken us, and a couple of markets have as well, with uh, with larger projects that they're financing. But we were able not only to reach uh, small and medium businesses, but we were able to reach nonprofits. Nonprofits were having a very difficult time with with the benefits of solar because. Uh, they weren't able to use the tax benefits, obviously, being a not-for-profit. 
um, and that would include a number of faith-based institutions. So through the commercial PACE program, we were able to, to open up the market to many, many more um, uh, uh, residents as well as, um, well, not residents in commercial PACE, but uh, commercial and industrial properties uh, throughout the state, which, uh, which really was a game changer for us. The, the other thing we, we did in our role as, as capital provider when we were starting out um, was to uh, demonstrate that these products or these investments could be uh, through the benefit of our standard financing agreement, uh, that they could be securitized. And so we used our balance sheet to aggregate these smaller transactions, some as small as 50,000, others ranging up to a million or so, the average size being about six or $700,000 in, the, in the, uh, the first two or three years of the program. And we aggregated those transactions and we securitized them and uh, issued bonds uh, to uh, a, a comp pace investor called Clean Fund. And we did that for uh, a facility of up to $30 million. So we, we demonstrated to the market that there, were, there was an appetite for, uh, for this type of activity. And, uh, and that uh, led to others uh, being able to securitize their transactions as well. The, uh, the other thing we did uh, after we demonstrated that we could uh, sell these transactions was we decided to partner with uh, Hannon Armstrong on what effectively became uh, a joint proposition to uh, underwrite and invest in, in uh, these transactions uh, on a larger scale basis. So, um, and we agreed uh, through our, our venture that we had um, to that the Green Bank would bring subordinated capital to to the uh, to the table, and we would take generally ten percent of the transactions, sometimes upwards of of twenty percent, and Hannon Armstrong would provide the balance of uh, of the capital required, and we did that for a, fac a facility that started at fifty million but had an accordion feature, which could expand up to $100 million. So that uh, then really uh, took away from us the need to have to securitize transactions. Uh, although we wanted to demonstrate the transactions could be securitized, we really didn't have the volume to, uh, to be able to um, uh, cost effectively securitize transactions repetitively. So we needed to hook up to a larger uh, private capital source, which, which, was, uh, which was Hannon and Armstrong. So we were able to do that. And uh, the results, as you see, are on the screen there. And, and uh, we can talk about anything about the CPACE um, structure later. Our solar for all, the, another area which, um, and I think this kind of goes back to what, uh, Thomas Murley, Murley was saying uh, earlier in the presentation when he said, um, you know, focus on an area that is, is uh, fixable. And one of the areas we determined needed to be fixed was providing uh, solar to underserved communities. Um, here you have a picture uh, in, uh, in Bridgeport, Connecticut, which is a distressed community, meaning that it is of lower income uh, and um, many of its residents have difficulty accessing credit. And not only that, they have, uh, because of their low income status, they cannot use uh, very efficiently um, the tax credits associated with solar PV the investment tax credit. So, um, to, so offering loans to this community to buy solar was not the answer because all you were doing, even if you were to give them a low interest rate on a loan, was to uh, put them in a position where, yes, they could buy the solar, but they couldn't get the full economic value because they were unable to use the tax credits. So, 
a third party ownership model was something that was really called for in this situation. Um, we became introduced to a group out of Louisiana called Posigen, and their actual focus uh, was not only on solar, but it was also in reaching these underserved communities uh, through, uh, through a, uh, uh, a marketing uh, push in those communities that would demonstrate the value of solar and also through a credit underwriting uh, that was not FICO based. So we were very intrigued by their model. They had very successfully underwritten transactions in the Louisiana market uh, coming out of the post-Katrina need for rebuilding uh, in, in that area. And uh, they were looking for ex uh, areas to expand and we're looking to New York and Connecticut in this area a uh, number of years ago. So we, uh, we issued an RFP to try to see if we could attract uh, someone to do this type of investment in our marketplace. Then they stepped forward with, uh, with a plan of action. And we were able to step forward with uh, initially uh, $5 million uh, of investment in, that was secured in pools of leases that solar PV leases that they would underwrite for the communities uh, where they started. They started out in Bridgeport, as you see here, but then expanded around the state. So we were able to really co-finance with Posigen because we, we understood the, the nature of the market, the fact that we had confidence that uh, homeowners uh, would be, uh, even though they were of low income, it did not mean they were of poor credit. Uh, our confidence has been uh, really substantiated by the performance of the program where the, uh, the credit difficulties have been uh, minimal, less than 1% of uh, the portfolio uh, has, uh, has been problematic. So um, in our ability to really start the, uh, what we did was with Posigen, we actually encouraged them to, uh, to expand uh, their, their uh, attraction to private capital by in the following sense. We said, look, we're going to provide you with the first uh, $10 million, but we're going to do it $5 million first in the door. And then the next five you can access on a dollar for dollar basis as you bring in other capital alongside us. Uh, because we wanted to, to, to get to encourage them to expand their reach into other sources of, of private capital and not just look to government. And um, it was the anchor of the Green Bank that allowed them to be successful in attracting uh, private capital to a marketplace of underserved and, and lower income credits that uh, the private capital wouldn't, wouldn't have otherwise uh, uh, come to the table for. So that has been very successful. Um, we now have tripled our investment in uh, the Posigen lease uh, structure as well as um, and it also includes some financing we have done with some other assets. Uh, but it has been a very, uh, very satisfactory program that we've been very pleased with the results. In uh, we also have been involved in, in energy, meaning on a more grid connected uh, scale. Uh, we do uh, a number of projects involving fuel cells. We have done wind, we have done small hydro, um, and all of, this, all of those transactions have taken advantage of uh, certain policies in Connecticut that have been supportive uh, for those uh, technologies. Um, and here we had the opportunity to participate uh, with quantum uh, biopower on, a, on an anaerobic digester facility in Southington, Connecticut. So the idea behind the project uh, was uh, that we would 
they would use organic waste that was otherwise going to landfill in the town of, of Southington. And, um, and that we would partner with private capital, which actually they brought the bank to the, to the table. It was um, People's United Bank. And uh, they, um, that was their senior lender. And the benefit that we brought to the table was our willingness to subordinate our investment. Uh, we we may have our, willing, our willingness, our willingness to subordinate our investment. And what that did for the senior lender was that enhanced their debt service coverage ratio. Um, and uh, we were confident in the long-term revenue streams uh, available through the anaerobic digester uh, program uh, that had been developed by our Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, uh, which, um, which uh, has been pr uh, proven to be the case as uh, they have been making all their loan payments uh, under our facility. So I'm gonna stop there. Um, and uh and turn it back to you brian great thank you bert thank you for that comprehensive review of some of our uh approaches to financing um so we recently put uh, our comprehensive plan out uh, that we call green bonds us um it's important to say that uh, protecting the environment by confronting climate change is also what brings us together so green bonds us, the environment unites us. The vision statement of the Connecticut Green Bank is a world empowered by the renewable energy of community, or said another way, a planet protected by the love of humanity. So we really have a strong tool here to be able to not only address our environmental problems, but more importantly, to build a better country um, and address all the social issues that we see um, still needing to be addressed across the country. Um, in order to confront climate change, uh, we need to continue to increase the level of investment that's going into the green economy. Uh, our predecessor, the Connecticut Clean Energy Fund, uh, invested $16 million of ratepayer funds to attract $6 million from private sources, so $32 million roughly a year. Uh, that equated to $9 per person per year of investment. Uh, we've uh, since taking that model, we uh, invested in the last couple of years about $40 million a year uh, of ratepayer uh, and other resources. We now generate interest income, so we reinvest that back uh, into our green economy uh, to attract $260 million from private sources. So uh, 10 times multiple, uh, this comes to about $90 per person per year. Um, now we know that based on studies that are out there, whether it's the Center for American Progress on the level of investment needed uh, in efficiency and renewable energy to achieve our climate goals across this country, uh, or the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, that the level of investment needed uh, is five to 10 times more than what we've achieved to date. Um, so that, it's, a, it's a massive amount of capital mobilization when you think about it in the context of the world. Uh, in Connecticut, you know, that's $450 to $900 per person per year, or about $3 billion uh, in Connecticut in a year. So, so that is what we are shooting for, is a massive amount of capital uh, mobilization in the green economy. Um, green bonds have the potential uh, to increase our investment uh, in our state, uh, across the country, uh, and around the world to confront climate change. Uh, $255 billion of green bonds were issued globally in 2019, uh, with U.S. issuances of about $50 billion. Uh, about 60% of the green bond proceeds were in clean energy. That's renewable energy and energy efficiency. Uh, the Climate Bond Initiative believes that a trillion dollars a year is possible. Um, and here, uh, what you're seeing is an article in Forbes magazine uh, speaking about the importance of green bonds. Uh, green bonds can solve our climate crisis. Uh, what's interesting about this article is that it not only cites two of the preeminent energy companies seeking to confront climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but it also highlights the Connecticut Green Bank's award-winning uh, asset-backed security that we issued uh, last year. 
So uh, in honor of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, uh, the Connecticut Green Bank has created the Green Liberty Bond, uh, a type of green bond whose proceeds are used to invest in projects that confront climate change. So beyond what we've been talking about in terms of providing families and businesses with access to capital to finance clean energy improvements in their homes, in buildings, uh, the Green Bank is now issuing bonds so that families can invest in green projects for others in their community to save for the planet. A Green Liberty Bond uh, is a form of green bond uh, that has three specific features to it. Uh, first, uh, the use of proceeds from the bond must go towards projects that confront climate change and create jobs in our communities. So these can be projects that mitigate greenhouse gas emissions like clean energy, for example, or projects that help society adapt to the impacts that climate change is causing like coastal resiliency, land conservation, and more. Um, I, I, I should have said earlier that the Green Bank by statute focuses on clean energy. So we are very mitigation focused, but that is not to say that green banks um, can't invest in adaptation. They can, if, if they are legislatively authorized, uh, we can apply the green bank model to land conservation, wetland protection, you know, all the sorts of resiliency things that we think about that we need to do for climate change. So the first thing this bond, uh, uh, this class of bond has to do is it has to really stand up the Paris Agreement, right, on, in terms of use of proceeds. Uh, and secondly, uh, modeled after the Series E war bonds of the 1940s, is that the bonds must be able to be purchased by everyday citizens through smaller denominations, no more than a thousand dollar denomination per bond. So we know from the war bonds uh, period that more than 85 million Americans purchased Series E war bonds, totaling $185 billion back in the 1940s are about three and a quarter trillion dollars today. So we took that example and want to create a financial instrument that allows citizens in our state, people across this country, to invest in confronting climate change by buying a bond whose proceeds get used to confront climate change. Uh, and thirdly, uh, because we want more and more citizens to buy green liberty bonds, there must be consumer protections embedded within the bonds. So these bonds are required to have independent certification and verification that use, the use of the proceeds are being invested to confront climate change. So a green liberty bond is simply a category of green bonds with the focus being to provide citizens with another way to invest to confront climate change. Stay tuned, next week, knock on wood, the green liberty bonds will be coming to market and you all can uh, look into them and if you so decide, uh, invest in one. Um, so I really wanted to wrap up here uh, with, so, so we're putting together um, propaganda, we, we're, we're taking the, uh, the history of the war bonds and, and creating uh, posters that help Connecticut tell a story. And, and I'm sure Maine has tons of stories about its innovation in terms of clean energy. I want to tell one story here about that, and we have a number of them here. One story that deals with Abraham Lincoln, one that deals with Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, actually, uh, on Eleanor Roosevelt, she was promoting the war bonds at the Bushnell Theater in Hartford, Connecticut in 1942. That same Bushnell Theater went through a major sea pace project where we took out an old heating oil bur uh, boiler and put in a more efficient boiler. So sea <laughs> pace actually applied to a space that uh, was very historic in the context of, of, of uh, World War II. Uh, but I wanted to focus on Teddy Roosevelt. You know, we're, we're talking to Mainers. Uh, conservation is important. This is the, the president, the, the leader of natural resource conservation. When you're talking about the square deal, uh, conservation was front and center uh, as, as well as consumer protections. Uh, but not many people know that um, the probably one and only presidential motorcade in an electric vehicle happened in downtown Hartford in 1902. And it was Teddy Roosevelt who was riding in this electric vehicle that was manufactured by uh, Colonel Albert Pope uh, in Pope Manufacturing. This was an entrepreneur who, as you can see around the electric vehicle, he licensed European bicycle technology. He manufactured um, millions of bicycles, became very wealthy. 
uh, he felt that the future of motor vehicles was around electric batteries. Um, he was quite frequented. He was about uh, in his late 40s, 40s, early 50s as he rolled out uh, his electric vehicle. He manufactured the first 500, uh, employed thousands of people in downtown Hartford. Downtown Hartford was known as the automobile capital of the U.S. at this time. Uh, a young Henry Ford frequented Albert Pope. Uh, Pope liked him. Uh, he felt he was very entrepreneurial. Uh, Henry Ford used to come to Hartford because there was a renaissance going on in terms of interchangeable parts. So Pope uh, frequented him often. He invited him to his plants. He didn't believe that um, uh, Ford's vision of the future of vehicles was the right vision. Internal combustion engine he didn't like. They were dirty. They were smelly. They were explosive. Uh, he felt that the future was electric vehicles. Um, unfortunately, Pope was latter in his years. He, he didn't have an heir with the same entrepreneur zeal that he had. He passed away. Um, somebody, you know, took over but didn't have the, the power and the muscle, the entrepreneurship behind them. Uh, and we got what we got today, which is the internal combustion engine. But this is to say that Teddy Roosevelt in Connecticut in an electric vehicle in 1902, here we are 120 years later, and we're coming back to where we should have been 120 years before. So green banks, what we think about often is what is the role of government to ensure that um, the society we wanna see that it benefits everybody can be created by putting capital in the hands of people who need it the most. Um, and we don't wanna see a story like this happen again to where we've missed the electric vehicle opportunity. Um, there are a lot, a lot of opportunities in front of us. Um, so I think with that, that that's our, our last um, slide. Uh, you know, we're, we're excited to, to hear what's happening in Maine. Um, uh, we can learn from each other. Um, if there's anything we can do to help, we're here to help. And uh, thank you for uh, having us as part of your summit today. Thank you, Brian. Um, that's fantastic. I, I really appreciate you joining us and, and sharing your experience. Um, do you have a few minutes to take a, a few questions? I know we're a little past five o'clock now. Um, great. Uh, so um, one, of the, one of the big questions that's come up today uh, is clearly we're in a time where the state budget is going to have a shortfall and you know, there's not going to be extra money available in the general fund. Uh, and so just what are some sources of initial capitalization um, that, that you know of that you would recommend that we look at? And um, we, we want to be careful. We don't want to steal a bunch of money from Efficiency Maine to fund a green bank. You know, we want it to be additive to our existing programs. So you're right. I mean, we are in challenging times. I think the... Uh, you know, the number one priority of state and local governments to the federal government these days is immediate relief, right? So I think in the, the recent House bill proposed a trillion dollars of local state relief, the National Governors Association on a bipartisan basis wanted to see, you know, a, a half a trillion dollars going to state and local governments. So state governments are struggling and, and we're seeing it in Connecticut and across the country. Um, so that really speaks to us being very mindful of how we talk about clean energy. Um, you know, Efficiency Maine is doing a tremendous, we learn a lot from all the air source heat pumps, like, like you are like the model for what all of the Northeast needs to achieve in terms of that climate wedge of decarbonizing how we heat uh, and cool our buildings. Um, so, you know, I think you need to hang on the principles of how can we use what we have today to accelerate the growth of our markets. And the message is one of, how do you bring the private sector in to be additive to what you're currently doing? Um, it'll be difficult because you, you, you have a set of resources that you need today to be investing in what you're doing. Um, but um, uh, I think getting the message out that the need, there's a need to take those tools and bring in more private investment and in, in engaging the private sector to be there with you, investing with you, you know, your local community banks, credit unions, uh, to be there side by side. But it's a it's a difficult uh, difficult issue, David. Um, that you know, what do we do in this day and age? And I guess uh, to be to be frank, um, 
the other thing that uh, we're working on is um, at a national level, uh, creating a national climate bank. So I know Abe was on earlier. Um, if you think about the federal government being an enabler of local uh, investment, uh, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act was a great uh, piece of legislation back in the late you know, 2010, early 2010s. Uh, Connecticut turned eight and a quarter million dollars into $130 million of investment. So the federal government can help here too. So if you're looking to help advocate for federal policies, a national climate bank driven to support states, uh, state green bank like efforts, uh, focus there uh, as well. Some energy can help there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I think that we might have a few more questions coming in over the chat. Um, Matt, do you want to ask a couple more? Yeah, I think the, um, the last one is a lot of people had it, but it, it was related to the green liberty bonds you were mentioning. I mean, are there other ways to um, ensure Mainers um, benefit from this? Mike was talking about equity earlier, and um, I think people, some people are just kind of concerned how can we ensure that um, maybe Wall Street investors aren't kind of the main folks investing? We need private investment, but how do you balance that? Great, great question. Actually, uh, I think when we came out of the gate as the nation's first green bank, it was like, okay, when's the green bank, Connecticut Green, green Bank going to partner with the Wall Street financial institution? And actually, I'm, I'm sure Bird is laughing right now because, you know, our focus has always been Main Street banks. You know, they're part of our local economy too. So you're talking about your community banks, credit unions, your state banks. Um, if you can work with them and teach them how to fish in this market, how to put their capital to work for the green economy, you can achieve a lot. Um, the first conversation I had when the policy passed in 2011 uh, was with the uh, CEO of the Connecticut Bankers Association. And he said to me, uh, the last thing our financial institutions want to see is another public-backed institution standing in front of our business. And my response was, uh, that, in fact, is not what we're here to do. Our, our responsibility is here is to bring your capital to bear to help the state solve its energy, environmental, and economic development problems by you providing consumers access with low cost long-term capital. And I think given the examples that Bert gave, we've done that. And if we were in the, in the room today asking that say, or having the same conversation, I think they would say uh, the Green Bank has been a, a good partner with the private sector. Uh, but there are parts of the economy that the private sector leaves behind. And, and the solar for all example that Bert gave is a perfect example where there's an unconscious bias that because you're low income or you're a person of color, that you are you have poor credit and, and you're a poor uh, loan prospect. That's completely incorrect. So uh, we had to take the risk, go out there, and now we're demonstrating how it can work. And in fact, uh, more benefits can accrue to our society by focusing on the most vulnerable. So I think green banks and specifically the National Climate Bank drives that point home that uh, we need to mobilize more investment uh, in uh, low-income, vulnerable communities. We, we commented recently uh, to the FDIC and Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, who was putting out um, some changes to the Community Reinvestment Act. And we essentially said that uh, our local banks that are state-regulated uh, should be able to um, give credit to those banks who put money not only into low income and communities of color, but also where uh, those investments are going towards mitigation and adaptation, they should immediately be qualifying, deemed qualifying activities. So we're trying to combine the vulnerable communities with climate adaptation and mitigation through regulation, um, but uh, it can happen. Uh, we just all need to be continue to be very vigilant in uh, supporting those communities, being very committed to it, collecting data, asking the right questions, tracking your performance, uh, being committed to finding partners who are willing to invest with you uh, in improving their lives. Perfect. Thank you, Brian. Um, I certainly appreciate your, your willingness to join us today. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure to hear from you and, and learn from your experience. 
Um, and I'm sure that as, as things develop further in Maine, you'll, you'll probably hear more from us and uh, we'll, we'll definitely love to, you know, learn, learn from your experience and, you know, the things that you've stumbled over so that we can try not to recreate the wheel and uh, have too many of the same stumbling blocks that, that you've undoubtedly run into over the years. Um, and so I want to wrap up um, by thanking the Sierra Club for hosting this summit and to everyone who volunteered their time organizing this today. Um, our deep gratitude to each of the panelists and presenters who, who shared their perspectives and their experience. Um, for all of the attendees, um, we'll send out an email in the next few days. Um, this was recorded and live streamed on Facebook as well. Um, and so we'll share the recording um, as well as some of the resources that have been mentioned today. Um, for any of the panelists or presenters, if you mentioned a website or, or resources that you want to share with the, all the attendees, um, please email that to me and, and we'll um, distribute that to, to everyone who was here. So um, thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon and um, hope we can all get out and enjoy the beautiful weather. Thank you.